acknowledge the Wiradjuri people who are the traditional custodians of this land. I would also like to pay respect to the elders, past, present and emerging of the Rawadjuri people and extend that respect to other Aboriginals present. Today we'll be hearing from a number of stakeholders including local councils, private citizens, Aboriginal groups and health services, private health providers and the local health district and the primary health network. I thank everyone for making the time to give evidence to this important inquiry. Before I commence, I would like to make some brief comments about the procedures for today's hearing. Today's hearing is being broadcast live via the Parliament's website. This is a trial and will be the first time the New South Wales Parliament has been able to broadcast a hearing held outside of Parliament House. A transcript of today's hearing will be placed on the committee's website when it becomes available. In accordance with the broadcasting guidelines, media representatives are reminded that they must take responsibility for what they publish about the committee's proceedings. While parliamentary privilege applies to witnesses giving evidence today, it does not apply to what witnesses say outside of their evidence at the hearing. I therefore urge witnesses to be careful about comments you may make to the media or to others after you complete your evidence. Committee hearings are not intended to provide a forum for people to make adverse reflections about others under the protection of parliamentary privilege. In that regard, it is important that witnesses focus on the issues raised by the inquiry terms of reference and avoid naming individuals unnecessarily. All witnesses have a right to procedural fairness according to the procedural fairness resolution adopted by the House in 2018. If witnesses are unable to answer a question today and want more time to respond, they can take a question on notice. Written answers to questions taken on notice are to be provided within 21 days. If witnesses wish to hand up documents, they should do so through the committee staff. In terms of the audibility of the hearing today, I remind both committee members and witnesses to speak into the microphone. And this is particularly important because of the sound quality at the back of the room. Uh, finally, could I uh, urge everybody to please turn their mobile phones to silent for the duration of the hearing. The uh, broadcast of the hearing will also cease during the um, allotted breaks. I now welcome our first witnesses. Could I ask each witness, starting from my left, to please state their name and position title and swear either an oath or affirmation. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Thank you. So I'm uh, Dr. Kerry Stewart. I'm a GP who works in parks. Uh, my affirmation is I solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. You can either seat or stand. You don't have to stand. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Milton Quigley, Mayor of Warren Shire Council. I choose to provide an affirmation. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Uh, Heather Druce, Councillor for Warren Shire. Um, my affirmation, I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Uh, we now have a, a little bit of time for a short opening statement from each of you. Do you all have a short statement that you wish to make? Yes, sir. I, I we'll start on my left again. Thank you. I thought, thank you for the opportunity of, of appearing here today. I thought I'd start with a, just a little bit of history of the Park Shire and the, particularly the Parks hospital and the services from it. The hospital was built in 2014 after years of lobbying to get a new hospital. $72.5 million new hospital was built following quite a few years of community consultation. There was also a $40.9 million upgrade of the Forbes hospital at the same time and there are some shared services that now operate under the Lachlan Health Service covering both towns. The service level agreed to by the Department of Health and the Parks community unfortunately have not been met. Two state-of-the-art operating theatres, for example, are underutilised. The maternity service offered in parks is no longer operating there 
there was a, also a rehab for cardiac issues, and that's now ceased the service that was operating in our old hospital. The maternity issue, we had major public meetings and forums and protests in parks two years ago, and, and despite a decade of warning about the retirement of three long-serving GP proceduralists, our maternity unit was closed in June 2019. A midwife-led model was proposed as an interim solution. Nearly two years later, Parks Maternity still has not delivered a, another baby. This is not acceptable in a town of a population of 12,000 people and a shire population of 15,000 people. As chair of the Country Mayor's Association of New South Wales, with the support of my executive, we surveyed all the regional councils uh, as to their issues and priority needs. Water security and health services were the two top priorities in regional New South Wales. So we greatly appreciate the opportunity afforded by this inquiry. A motion to go to our next meeting in two weeks' time is to ask the State Government to create a Minister for Regional Health just like what has happened with the road network, with a Minister for Metropolitan Road Network and a Minister, Paul Toole, uh, who looks after rural road networks. And we think that model should be applied to health as well, given the disparity between health services in the metropolitan area and regional areas. One concern that's been expressed is that the resources allocated to base hospitals, and in our case that's Orange and Dubbo, has been done at the expense of the hospitals in regional towns. We're not saying that the wonderful services that Orange and Dubbo provide to the regional communities is not needed, but we should make sure that the other regional towns, the medium-sized towns around that 10,000 population, need to be serviced as well. It's my pleasure now to introduce Dr Kerry Stewart, who is a, a GP at Parks, to talk about GPs and our crisis in that situation in parks, mental health, aged care support and allied health. Thank you, Kerry. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so, um, Kerry Stewart, and I again reiterate, thank you so much for holding this inquiry and I bring the appreciation from um, our healthcare, healthcare providers in parks. So I'd like to just um, acknowledge that today is actually World Family Doctors Day and there are four themes and one of the themes is building a future with family doctors and primary care teams and uh, so I'm, I'm privileged to appear here today and to represent GPs and, and, um, and primary carers in, in parks. So uh, I've lived and worked in parks since 2013. I completed my registrar, GP registrar training in parks and remained on as a GP. Uh, parks is my home and I intend to live and practice there for the foreseeable future. Uh, raise my family I love rural medicine and uh, I love the challenges of rural medicine and acknowledge that there's always been issues around resources and scarcity and complexity within rural medicine and it's with that you know, knowledge that I've embraced this career path and so um, I just want to celebrate that and acknowledge that rural doctors uh, thrive on challenges and thrive in these environments um, quite frequently. And we have incredible dedica um, dedication, skill, resilience, you know, innovation and work really well quite often in these situations. I'd just like to acknowledge though that there comes a time when scarcity, limitation and reduction in resources is no longer a challenge but is in fact disabling. And there comes a time when critical resources are lost that make the continuation of a safe quality service unsustainable and in fact unachievable when the gaps in resources make it unsafe for both patients and clinicians, and it's at this stage that a health service can become, in fact, a disservice. So we're on the precipice of this scenario in parks, I believe. We um, are facing an acute shortage of general practitioners particularly, um, and this is resulting in an inability of our current GP workforce to have the capacity to provide essential care to members of our community, including our aged care residents. It's also resulting in a reduction of in our ability to have multidisciplinary sorry, collaboration with our colleagues within the community. So um, I've spoken in preparation for this inquiry with our three practices in town. And so um, in recent years, practices that have had up to seven full-time equivalent GPs are down to two, three or less. 
And so of our three practices in town, one has three full-time equivalent GPs, one has 1.8 full-time equivalent GPs, and this is about to reduce with one of the GPs moving to further part-time work. And the other practice has a variation from about 1.8 to 3 GPs. This practice has proceduralist general practitioners who work and provide services, not just in a general practice clinic setting, but also to the hospital. And so on different days, it's not uncommon to have one or potentially no doctors in that clinic. With a maximum of eight full-time equivalent doctors serving a town of 12,000 people uh, and its surrounding areas, it's no wonder there are really long um, wait times for appointments. There's almost zero or there are zero on the day or emergency appointments and uh, there's great difficulty providing follow-up uh, which is causing great frustration for both the clinicians and obviously the patients. Doctors are working weekends and extra days to provide COVID and flu clinics. Often in these clinics, we're also you know, putting out fires, so providing emergency scripts for patients, emergency referrals, organising medical appointments to get things like driver's licence for farmers who live a significant distance from town. Um, and the situation is about to get significantly worse with three of our long-serving doctors uh, indicating their imminent retirement. And they have actually given information very recently to our aged care facilities saying they're no longer able to provide um, ongoing GP services in person or, or at all, in fact, to those, um, to those facilities. And so that leaves us with um, literally 80% of our aged care residents in parks without a GP uh, post June 30th. And we do not have capacity as remaining GPs in town to pick up that, that patient load. So this has a flow-on effect, obviously, um, to our community health providers. There's pressure on pharmacies, there's pressure on our allied health um, colleagues as well. Um, look, we love the fact that there's telehealth and remote health services available, um, but at this point there are, this should be an adjunct and it should be supporting GPs who are able to fulfil um, you know, services in the town. And at the moment we don't have that critical mass of GPs to even offer that service to then be supported. Locums are great and we really appreciate them. They bring a lot of skill and knowledge and they work hard and they do fill a really important gap. The issue is once they leave, they leave a backlog of results, um, investigations and patient care to follow up, which then the remaining GPs need to have some capacity to, to carry on that care, which we currently don't. So I'd like to celebrate, you know, that we do have amazing services. We have a lot of um, resources. Uh, that are coming on board to address some of our mental health issues um, and, and provide those services. What we do need is a directory that gives our community access to knowing what these services are and how to get to them without necessarily having to go through the bottleneck that is getting an appointment with a GP at the moment. So that's certainly something that I would advocate for. Um, there are some amazing innovations, so technologically, that our pharmacies are putting into place and some of our other allied health professionals that can help with, uh, again, reducing that bottleneck of going through a GP to get referrals and services. There is a lot of discussion uh, around the collaborative care model and I offer my absolute support and enthusiasm for that and would be um, incredibly excited and enthusiastic to, to be involved with that. Uh, recruitment and retention of GPs is very challenging um, and one of the issues that's been identified is that Parks is not classified as a distribution priority area. Uh, I think there's been a submission to this inquiry, is that correct me, um, which indicates this and so when you look on a map of Western New South Wales you'll see the, the, the shocking or the stark um, you know, spot on the map that is Parks that is not DPA classified uh, while areas such as you know, Dubbo, Orange, Wagga are in fact DPA classified. In my conversations with our other three practices, each or with the other two practices in my own practice, it's been indicated that a reclassification would immediately have an effect on their ability to uh, recruit and, and place doctors. Uh, along with that, we do need to acknowledge that many of these doctors will be international medical graduates and we need to offer support for them to become uh, or to be able to get onto training programs uh, because we do, I hope we're all aware that um, if they're not uh, on a training program or in fact vocationally registered or, or a GP specialist, they will have significantly lower billing, Medicare billing, which then makes it difficult or financially less viable to have these doctors in our town. So that's something that's really important as well. Looking at remuneration, um, and I think this is certainly something that the state can contribute to, so looking at potentially uh, salary packaging uh, of, of positions that would offer both maybe generalist but also general practice services to our community. Um, there has been some suggestions from fellow GPs about looking at maybe pools of doctors, and so we have amazing centres such as Dubbo and Orange where we have a, you know, a supply of 
general practitioners, but also some hospital-based doctors that potentially would be a pool that we could use to provide some services to parks. And this would have a great effect, both um, you know, providing experience and communication from those larger centres to parks and offering that excellent you know, educational and um, you know, upskilling for our, our local uh, health providers as well. So that would be a, a model that we would certainly be excited to explore. Um, and we fully support that the collaborative model and looking at establishing a local uh, medical network and a collaboration, um, certainly with, within parks, but within the Greater Lachlan area, if that were uh, able to be undertaken. Um, and once again, we do support the establishment of the rural medical schools and the placement of junior doctors and JMOs into general practice. One of our issues are that we need fellow GPs who can provide supervision uh, for those those um, junior doctors and medical students, and certainly remote services we are an option, but there's a lot of value in having um, you know peer support so and and um, in person mentoring. So thank you again for the opportunity to talk and to present Parks and to let you know particularly about you know I'm sure that there are definitely um, concerns and issues to be addressed within the the hospital system, but certainly in the primary uh, healthcare community we're really. Uh, at a point where we need some immediate assistance. And as I said, you know, our top priorities would be around that, um, the deep review of the DPA classification, uh, looking at potentially like the remuneration or um, sort of doctor sharing kind of options, and then um, the collaborative care model we welcome with open arms and great support. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much. Um, Councillor Quigley, and, and just a reminder to try and keep the opening statement short because we, we do have quite a few questions that we would like to ask, ask the group as well. Thank you. Certainly. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, firstly, look, thank you very much for the opportunity to present to this inquiry into um, to, uh, health outcomes and uh, access to health and hospital services in rural and remote New South Wales. Um, I and Councillor Drews um, represent a small um, council in terms of population, but large area. So Warren Shire Council is 10,760 square kilometres, but we only have a population of 2,730 odd people. So our challenges are a little bit different to those of parks. We're, we're very, very small, very remote. Just for, by way of background, Councillor Druce is a, a, a former nurse, a registered nurse, and has some expertise in that area. Um, I'm a practicing dentist in private practice in Warren and have been there for 31 years. Um, so um, there is uh, that, that background that um, perhaps gives us some, some degree of credibility. What I would say though is, is our population being small, there are nonetheless about 20.8% of that population is 65 years or over. 17.7% um, of that population is Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander. So immediately we've got that challenge of uh, probably a less mobile population in terms of accessing health services. And then of course, of course there's the, the issue of geography and um, we're a, a long irregular shaped council, um, longer north, south and east, west. Um, and so those on the eastern end of our shire can travel 120 k's or so to, to Dubbo, but those on the north west corner travel 300 plus k's. And so this is not news to your inquiry. Geography is a, is a real issue in terms of people accessing health um, and, and getting the health outcomes that, that they want. On the other side, one of my bugbears is that increasingly the burden for provision of health services is being placed on local government. And to that end, Warren Chai Council has built a purpose built medical facility, um, able to um, house uh, three medical GP practitioners as well as allied health people. We also subsidise some rental for doctors who are staying. Um, but in my view, often local government is being asked to step up to the plate when in fact the imprimatur of health services belongs in the state and the federal spheres. And uh, our communities, uh, as Councillor Keith suggested, are really asking for health provision of health services one of their top priorities and we need to overcome these sorts of issues and get on top of them. You know, in, in many ways, we're grateful for the opportunity to speak here today, but it's sad that it's actually become such a systemic issue that it needs to be addressed by an inquiry. And uh, we're seeing that these incidents, they're, they're in the Parkses of the world, they're in the Warrens of the world, they're, they're in the Cobars and the, and the Burks of the world. So yeah, we need to sit back and reflect about where we are, but then essentially move forward. Our communities uh, identified really five areas that they see as the 
the stumbling blocks in, in health, um, those being provision of GP services. The second one is the, the recruitment and training of those working um, in health and particularly in the acute area of health in the MPS and um, more recently in the aged care area. The third one is <clears throat> um, the ongoing provision of aged care within our town so that people do not have to move out of their town, um, the area that they've known all their lives to, to really have the health outcomes that they need. The last two pertain really more to um, allied health and as um, Dr Stewart touched on, the idea that there are a significant number of allied health um, professionals come into our town on a continuing basis, but um, often not often enough um, to provide services. But many of our community don't understand or aren't aware of those services being provided. And I think there's a serious shortcoming in terms of knowing about the allied health services that come in that could provide much better health outcomes. And the final point is really just access to those allied health services. And as Dr Stewart alluded to, you know, people have to come in and um, asking for a, a doctor to provide um, a driver's license, um, okay, or um, uh, a medical intervention, a physiotherapist will come to the Warren MPS, but to access their service, you have to see a GP. If there's no GP available, then that all falls down, it becomes too hard. People don't follow through to get the health outcomes that they, they really need. And so those six areas really, really cover off on, on what we would like to talk about. And we, we I think we'll take the opportunity when, when as questioning goes, we might elaborate a little bit more on those, but particularly the recognition from Western Local Health District that the GPs provide the anchor for every health service within small, remote towns like ours, and even in bigger towns as the parks as the world we're talking about. So I think anything we can do in, from the outcome of this inquiry to have GP services as that cornerstone, as Scott McLaughlin and, and Shannon Knott have presented to joint organisation of councils meetings, suggesting that that is the cornerstone. We need to proceed along that way and get that in place. Um, and the more quickly that can occur, the better. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Drews, did you have a short... Thank you. <laughs> we will now move um, to questioning. So we will get questions from the government, the crossbench and the opposition, and each group will have six and a half minutes. And we will start with the Honourable Walt Seckord. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor, Councillor Keith uh, and Dr Stewart, if, if, you could, if we could talk about Parks Hospital. So in your submission, you say, and I quote, state-of-the-art operating theatres which are largely unused. So you have a brand new hospital, or well, relatively brand new hospital, built in 2014. So it's six, seven years old, brand new hospital. So what's actually happening with those operating theatres? Look, they're being underutilised at the moment, uh, and we've. What's disappointed the parks community is that when we agreed with the Department of Health on the services that the new hospital should deliver, we thought, oh, good, we'll have beautiful health services moving forward. Yeah. Seven years later, it's not the case. Uh, what were the services that were promised? The, now, just to prompt you, maternity services, you were given the impression that there were going to be maternity services in a community of 15,000 people. That's correct. Maternity service has been a huge issue for the community, and there was a big rally, and yep. hundreds of people turned up uh, wanting to retain maternity services in parks. At the moment, Parks and Forbes work together as the Lachlan Health Service and there are maternity services available in a level three form in Forbes, but only a level two midwifery led model proposed for Parks. But that hasn't as yet to eventuate two years, two years later. Uh, the operating theatres to, you know, equivalent to Royal North Shore in Sydney, to operating theatres that uh, are only doing very minor surgeries and they were there originally to support maternity in the case of caesareans and so forth or any medical intervention that's noted. But we've had instances where somebody had a dislocated collarbone, yeah. uh, dislocated shoulder rather, and they weren't able to get that shoulder put in because an anaesthetist that 
used to serve as maternity was no longer available, so they had to be transferred to Orange to receive anaesthetic to have that child to put back in. And to me, for a simple operation like that, we should have those services being able to be delivered in, in theatres like parks. And why uh, doctors, either from Orange or from Sydney, can't come up and utilise those theatres to do procedures in I mean, there's talk of doing colonoscopies now in, in that Parks Hospital. Don't do colon you, you don't do colonoscopies? Not but yet. They're about to, but that's the sort of problems that we have, is that the doctors are now not going up to Parks, and the danger for our theatres is that not only are the doctors not coming, but then the theatre staff aren't getting experience and aren't getting a career path to be able to utilise those facilities. So if we don't start to get doctors coming up to Parks. When we built the hospital, yep. we actually had an accommodation facility built as well, so there would be somewhere for those doctors and registrars and different people to stay and come and help service the, the theatres and the hospitals. So what's happening in these operating theatres, or not happening? So what's actually happening in the operating theatres? Kerry might know more than I, but Doctor, uh, Doctor, not a lot. Dr Stewart, so what happens in the Parks Operating Theatres. I'll, I'll um, lead by saying I don't work at Parks Hospital and okay, I... But you're a doctor in that community. Yeah, so I, I, and I, I'm, I'm hoping the LHD would be able to give you exact numbers and dates, etc. So I spoke to one of our, um, my senior colleagues who do do procedural work at the hospital and in fact does um, some surgical, so mostly skin, so advanced skin excisions. Um, and he gave me a list of various specialists. So we do have specialists who come, I believe there's one that comes from Dubbo once a month and does some uh, general surgical uh, lists, so small procedures such as lap collies and sort of general surgical procedures. We do have a gynaecologist who comes across from Orange, uh, I, I believe it's once a month, and again, I, I, you would have to clarify this with the LHD uh, or Parks Hospital directly, uh, and another general surgeon who comes across, um, possibly two general surgeons from, from uh, Orange, but they come essentially once a month. And then we have our local uh, GP proceduralist who does his list once a fortnight, um, again, doing minor surgical proceedings. So his comment to me, actually yesterday, was that on any given week, there would be a maximum of two theatre lists. Um, and that's his information okay. to me. Now, to people who don't understand, when you say theatre lists, you mean lists for a day, so two days. Sorry, um, like a, a surgeon performing operations. That's yep. so. Whether it's a, a full day from you know eight till yep. four, or whether it's a part thereof, I, I'm I'm unclear. It would depend on the bookings and, and okay. but yeah. So so on any given week, there would be two days that the that the theatre a a single theatre is is operating. Is my understanding. Uh, so three days a week, the parks operating theatre would be vacant. That's my understanding. Yes. Yep. Yep. That, that was my understanding too. I'm sorry, yep. but. I wanted to get there in your words. Yes, sorry. Yes, okay. Thank you. But as I said, I, I don't work there, but that is a direct conversation I have with a doctor who does work there, and I'm, the, the hospital would hopefully give you exact So the details. ludicrous situation is that the Parks Operating Theatre is closed more than it's open. Absolutely. Yeah. That would be correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, what about wait times for a GP in your, in your community? What is the typical uh, wait for an appointment? Not with yours, but with all three A month. Of easily a month and that's if and so when I say a month that's if you were to ring wanting a standard appointment for you know ongoing medication etc if it's urgent on the day there are essentially often no zero appointments so the answer is so what about, under, what about it? they go to the hospital yeah so that's does that put an extra burden on the hospital I imagine so yeah yeah right. So, so oh, sorry. sorry, and then um, I do know at different times, depending on the availability of GPs, and so certainly if, a G, if there are GPs who are so I say, fully booked, there's a certain amount of time. You know, once you're filled up for essentially a month or so, you can't offer appointments further ahead because that just then blows that out to six and eight. So sometimes when they ring, they just say, I'm sorry, there is no appointment. You, you can't even book one for a month because we are... If we start doing that, we, we push it on. And so we have a, a system whereby we say, look, if you can ring tomorrow, obviously, you know, let's say today's Wednesday, so Wednesday for the next four weeks is fully booked. But if you ring 8.30 tomorrow morning, suddenly Thursday, does, four how, weeks, opens up. And how does can, that make you feel as a person who's obviously connected to your community? Oh, it's incredibly difficult. And it, you feel a sense of... Um, it's that you're really torn because you would love to open the doors and say, everybody, come in, but that's not possible. And it makes it very, I can appreciate the patient's absolute frustration and anger and, and you know, disappointment. But as a clinician, you, 
you can't offer good, safe medicine if you can't follow people up. So there's no point seeing someone today and then saying, I'll follow you up for this urgent result or this urgent review, but I have no appointments for four to five to six weeks. And so it's, it's really difficult and it, it creates an environment of you know, frustration and dissatisfaction in work that's otherwise absolutely marvellous work. So it is really difficult. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I just have a quick question for uh, Councillor Keith. Um, in your submission, um, it said that the council was having to often fill the gap and spend money on health service deficiencies. Can you give us some examples where the council's actually had to step in to fill these gaps? Yes, we had a, what we called a GP cup, and it's been running for a few years, uh, when we recognised that the need for additional GPs to come to parks about four years ago, five years ago, uh, and we had community sporting days, uh, and they competed for the GP Cup and they raised money and we raised over $200,000 to go towards the recruitment of GPs to subsidise their freight and their moving expenses to parks or their desire to come up and have a look at our town. We paid for their air flights and do things like that. Do you think that, that. That's, that's a normal thing that, that councils should have to do to actually fundraise for local health care? Look, it's not. I mean, health is not a local government responsibility, but our communities are telling us this is our biggest concern. We want you to voice our concerns about healthcare in our communities. Mm. We appreciate the collaboration we have with the various health services, the local health network, and you know, Scott McLaughlin, Shannon Knott, and those people are always willing to talk. And we've had some very constructive conversations about the new collaborative care model coming up. But we've been talking to them about you know, the, the need for more GPs and some method of attracting those to our mm. town. Mm for many years, uh, but nothing has really been achieved and we're now hitting a, a crisis point. And, and has uh, Warren Council experienced something similar where you've had to raise money for healthcare? No, we, we haven't been in that same situation as of yet, but you know, our community's enunciating that same degree of frustration that Councillor Keith um, has, has said there. We've gone from, we had two um, GPs resident in the town quite some time, one recently re retired and one uh, who's actually presenting later today um, who's moved to a different location. But we've gone from two full-time GPs and when it, the, the numbers would suggest that we should have had three anyway then. They were hard-working, diligent people and overworked. Now we're back to 1.5 full-time equivalents, so we're really short at least one and a half again. And then, and then there's, there's, there's lies, damn lies and statistics. That 1.5 sits back at one doctor uh, during one week and then two during the next week. And then no VMO um, at times, no one particularly over weekends um, to see those accident and emergency things that, that happen in a, in a rural landscape. And so, yeah, degree of frustration from our community in terms of GPs on the ground. Thank you. And Ms Fairman? Thank you. I just wanted to go to something you said in your opening statement, Dr Stewart, that um, here in Parks, you said we're on the pre precipice of healthcare in Parks becoming a disservice, not a service. What are you calling for from the government right now to ensure that the Parks Health Service doesn't become a disservice? What do you need? Uh, we, need we need a... Um, a, a, a I guess a, a critical mass or a critical number of, in, in certainly in Mike's GPs, um, and I think reiterating what what both um, councillors have said, you know, GPs and that primary care model is what holds the health of our community and stops that flow into our hospitals. Um, and look, you know, yes, Parks Hospital. Um, you know, my understanding is that a lot of the emergency services have been provided by locums, but look, there are emergency services, you know, we are able to see emergency patients. Um, so the hospital is sort of doing, you know, its part, it, it's, it's the primary care. And if we could catch those people and service them in the community, we, we save that deluge of going through, you know, to the hospital and, and being our backstop. Um, you know, really the primary health, um, you know, number of clinicians is, is, is what we need. Um, in short, 
Okay, and what, so what do you think that the, like the advertising, the kind of advertising and recruitment process is adequate? I think it can always be better. Um, one of my colleagues who has recently done some interviewing for Akram Independent Pathway, so they're obviously um, doctors who are looking to do rural remote medicine. Uh, some of them had some fantastic qualifications, including some emergency qualifications, etc. And some of them didn't, her, her comment to me was some of them didn't know Parks, where Parks was or that it existed or that there were opportunities there. So yes, there's always avenues for improving our um, advertising and our, um, you know, awareness of, of, of medical needs in communities. My other comment would be around that DPA classification and the comment that each practice has indicated that with um, a reclassification of parks into a, a distribution priority area, that would open up some um, doctors or, or GPs, um, many of them not on uh, pathways is my understanding, or to be um, to fellowed, but they certainly are doctors that could be mobilised and, and located into our practices in parks if that classification were adjusted. Thank you. Madam Chair, I'm just wondering, it might be an appropriate time if I could table a document that shows my correspondence mm -hmm. to the Honourable Mark Colton and to the Deputy Prime Minister, our local member, regarding that uh, distribution area of need. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you. Just in potentially specifically in relation to that as well, and this is possibly for the councillors, We've had some submissions that um, are essentially lobbying for a different way of treating the LHD, specifically that there is kind of like a rural remote LHD. There should be, if you like, a metropolitan and a regional and the issues are so much different. What are your views on that? Dr Stewart, I can see you nodding furiously, but I might also see if the councillors, um, Councillor Drews, did you have an opinion on that perhaps? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I, I believe that um, every community has their own needs and, a, and one size doesn't fit all and I really think they need to, to separate yeah, um, the communities. They're all very different. Um, you know, demographics with ours, with the aged care and... Is that all right? Keep going? Yeah. Um, yeah, I just think they need to really divide, yeah, the services. Yeah. Dr Stewart, did you also want to... Oh, I would just... Um, I completely agree. And I think yeah. that collaborative care model, which really looks at, you know, that discussion between the P um, LHD, the Rural Doctors Network, and the PHN, I think... I hope that that's what that's going to bring to the table. Yep. OK, great. Thank you. We now move to government questions. The government member have questions? Thank you very much for, for appearing today, um, all of you, and, and thank you very much for sharing your experiences. I think it's really important that uh, uh, those of us um, who are in Parliament come out and hear uh, your stories and, and your experiences. Um, I guess I'd like to start first um, with uh, Councillor uh, Keith. Um, now, Parks um, has um, advocated, as you've said, um, to uh, the, the federal uh, member and um, and uh, 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 sorry, um, uh, Mr. Coulton um, in, in his um, area around health. Obviously, they're both um, federal. Um, so, with with primary health care being, I guess, the federal requirement, um, how do you how do you see the state um, and New South Wales working in with that system to ensure that we've got the the, the health care being provided to uh, all the communities, not just yours? Look, the uh, distribution area of need is something that's reviewed every three years, and to me that's probably too long. We've probably had enough GPs at that particular point in time three years ago, but it doesn't reflect what's happening now. Yeah. And so maybe that needs to be an annual review by the, the federal government based on, I believe, Medicare, uh, the number of claims that are lodged through doctors and so forth. So it does pick up locums and things like that that are claimed through Medicare as well. So it may not be a GP that's actually stationed in that particular community. Yeah. So I think some liaison between state and federal governments to straighten that out. But I, I think the potential of creating more generous uh, financial wage packages for doctors to recognise their training as a rural generalist in regional New South Wales and creating packages that actually 
remunerate them at an appropriate level for the risk that they have to take and the knowledge they have to acquire to be able to practice out there. Yeah. Uh, I think it's my understanding that Queensland have more generous packages and they've solved their regional health problems as a result. And I think creating a minister for re regional health would go a step forward where she can actually be in cabinet or he or she could be in cabinet arguing the case for additional expenditure to be al allocated to the local health districts in regional areas. At the moment, you know, Scott McLaughlin and, and his team at local health district <coughs> provide some wonderful dialogue and some lovely consultation and we get positive vibes and we're trying to work with them and will with this collaborative model. But at the end, they're being tied by budgetary constraints and I think at the end of the day, the state government has to have a serious look at whether they want to provide good regional health or not because it, it, it's at a crisis point. Well, I know we definitely do and as somebody who lives in a you know, regional area, I'm, I've, I've got a real strong advocacy for it. Um, it's a bit of a vexed question because we've heard um, in recent um, inquiries that uh, money is, is, is one part of the, the issue, but it's not the only part. And, you know, attracting people to um, regional communities um, is about that. It's sometimes about the community. And I, and I think, uh, Dr Stewart, you've actually sort of um, alluded to that. You know, we've got to make those uh, people that come feel welcome. And um, Councillor Quigley, Councillor Drews, um, I know particularly, um, you know, we heard yesterday that uh, the small communities, like yours, um, are very good at um, making people feel welcome uh, and also in engaging. Do you think you could share a little bit of what you do to um, uh, attract and, and provide a community um, that, that embraces uh, doctors to get them to stay? Because we know that if people come, they fall in love with the place and they do want to stay. Yes, thank you for that. Look, we, we certainly do go out of our way to welcome those into our town and particularly those who are professionals. Um, and I, what I do believe, there, there is a capacity for the movement of GPs into small country towns. And we've seen that um, evidence of that in that Burke have been able to secure the, um, the services of, of some GPs and our near neighbour to the north, Canamble, have been able to do the same thing. So I think it's very much the idea that you, you can offer all the services that, that do occur in a bigger town. We go out of our way as our council to develop our town. We, make, we want to make it a town that our children would be happy to come back to. And that means providing every service that we can, we can possibly provide in terms of sporting facilities, clubs, um, facilitating every, everything that one can think of um, to make it an attractive, attractive town. Um, we do have, uh, anecdotally, um, a number of um, graduate medical um, people from our area. Um, one of those practices part-time, um, not in Warren, but locally nonetheless. And so we're gratified by that. But I think the opportunity is to grow our own is, is, the, is the essential point here. Um, and I concur with Councillor Keith in that monetary uh, value and, and making those people feel valued in your community goes as, as part of that. And we would, we would and do go out of our way to make people particularly welcome. That's why, you know, the doctor, the, the GP that retired has stayed in our town. You know, he had the opportunity to move anywhere and has stayed in our town. And I think that the, there is the opportunity to be really part of something and, and I see that in my professional life, to be part of something that you really, you can see a town grow, you can see a community grow. Um, it's the, there's the experience that goes with being part of a small country town. It's not something to be frightened of, it's something to embrace. It really is, and, and both of you have actually had that provision of health care in, 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 you know, Warren, no less. So um, you, you'll both understand it, so. Yes. Um, and I might, sorry, um, I'll just um, add too that, that I think um, we need to, to try and get some incentive happening to get nursing staff. Because yep. I'm hearing on the local Burke radio station they're asking for, for um, casual RNs in about 15 hospitals in the, in the western area. And uh, I think there needs to be something done about getting some sort of incentive happening to get nurses into our, our small hospitals. Doctors, oh, so definitely. Yes, yes. Yes. Sorry, we've just got one last, uh, very quick question. Well, I had a few, but uh, <laughs> just one that's, that's really raised 
concerns to me. And I don't know if it's directed really at you, uh, Councillor Keith, but it's in your submission. Uh, you mentioned about mental health issues, particularly youth suicide, is increasing dramatically in regional New South Wales. Why, why do you think that's the case? Look, I think it's a combination of a couple of years of drought and our mice plagues and things like that, and employment opportunities uh, are limited in some areas, and certainly there's been an increase in suicides in the Park Shire area, and uh, the health department has recognised that and are going to establish a, a health walk-in centre in the middle of town and will open in the middle of the year. So there's a recognition of that. It's very hard to put your finger on why that's happening. Uh, I think COVID has created a bit of isolation and not the opportunity to, to go into metropolitan areas or the danger of catching COVID. So people are a bit isolated in rural communities. And I think that's had a, it's a combination of all those sort of issues moving forward. Parks has a special activation precinct, as you'd be aware, as people in the government. And we've created our unemployment has dropped out value of homes and rural land has increased quite dramatically over the last 12 months. Uh, but we've had an employer who has to get medical certificates to, for people to be able to be employed to work on that new SAP and uh, they can't get an appointment to get the medical certificates so therefore they're not meeting the obligations of their contract and it's making life very difficult for job, young people to get jobs the way they should be able to get them. So I think it's a combination of a range of Things, uh, yeah. There's a lack of opportunities for young people. Dr. Stewart, do you have anything? Uh, so, to sorry, add? Uh, that does actually conclude our hearing. I did say one, one more question. Um, <laughs> but thank you all for attending today. We really appreciate you coming in and providing evidence. Um, we will now move to a short break before we hear from our next witnesses and we will end our streaming for a short period of time. Thank you, everybody, and we are back on air, live streaming. Um, I now welcome our next witnesses. Could I ask each witness, starting from my left, to please state their name, position title, and swear either an oath or affirmation. Anne-Marie Chandler, owner in DigConnect Dubbo. Uh, I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Ms Keed? Jamie Keed, um, Practice Manager of Dubbo Aboriginal Medical Service. Um, I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Hi, I'm Dr Amy Lee Perrin. I'm the CMO, um, one of the GPs from the Dubbo AMS. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare an affirmation that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. And I'm now giving an opportunity for each of you to give a short opening statement. Uh, Ms Chandler, do you have an opening statement you'd like to give? Um, I'm not sure exactly what the opening statement is, so I'll just tell you a little bit of background. I'm a Wail woman from Galar, Gumbone area, and I started in DigConnect in uh, December 2019 um, as an Aboriginal business for Aboriginal people to reduce our barriers and create um, an opportunity for financial independence. Um, it, it just started from my heart and we're still here today. We survived COVID and a few other different things. Um, but I've had to pivot the business a lot to be able to do that and due to funding issues as also. But we're still here, we're still going strong and we're building well. Uh, I guess I'm here today um, from the submission I obviously made and mm -hmm. things that I said in that. So I'll Thank you. And, and we all have that submission and we yeah. have read it. So thank you very much. Uh, Ms Key, do you have an opening statement you wish to make? No. no? Ms Perrin? No? no? Wonderful. In that case, we will move uh, straight to questioning. Um, so we will divide our time between government, opposition and crossbench, and we will be starting with the Honourable Walt Seckord. Um, and each uh, party will have uh, just over 14 minutes. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I guess Ms Keed and Dr. Dr. Perrin, if you could give a bit of a perspective. Now we've heard in Western New South Wales that there are lengthy waits and a lack of services 
in communities, particularly in MPSs, and that um, a lack of doctors and the burden is falling to, to nurses. And in some communities, there are waits of, of up to or more than six weeks to see a GP. Now, that experience must be, in fact, compounded in the Aboriginal community with Aboriginal community members reluctant to see a doctor, delaying to see a doctor until it's actually too late or you know, too late to do so. So, Dr. Perrin, as, as a person who I think you work in the Aboriginal Medical Service, mm -hmm. if you could actually give a perspective on that. Um, I agree with the statement that you've made. It definitely is difficult to attract doctors to our region and to retain those doctors. Um, we personally have been trying to recruit for six months for extra doctors at the AMS. Um, currently it's just myself, a registrar and a locum working in our service. Um, I certainly do have six week waits for regular appointments. Yes. Six week waits. Yes. Six week waits. So, um, what do you do in an emergency? Si Sorry, because of time constraints, I'm going to we jump. Do, we do have acute appointments for those emergency situations, and I am prepared to see walk ins um, on the day for those sick patients. But of course, there's only so much you can do in a, in a day. Um, so, it definitely is something that I do find difficult. Um, compounding that is the access. The access to specialist services is quite lacking in our community. Uh, not only the specialist services themselves, but also affordable specialist services. Uh, during COVID, we lost a lot of cardiologists here in Dubbo, so we had upward of a 12-month wait for a private cardiologist, and I was personally sending patients to Orange, to Bathurst, to Sydney, to Newcastle to try and see a cardiologist. Um, in the time where we're waiting for specialists, the GPs have to hold the patient, keep them well. Um, so we're seeing them a lot more frequently as well, which also compounds the um, increasing waiting lists because we're not seeing those new patients with the new chronic diseases. We're also reviewing our prior patients. Um, and that goes across the board with a lot of specialists. So it's not just cardiology, it's ENT, it's paediatrics, it's rheumatology. Um, dermatology across the board. Um, waiting times for surgeries are also quite extended as well. So quite often they will max out those 365 day waiting periods for a category three. So during those times as well, we're also um, you know, managing the pain, managing the symptoms of those surgical conditions that require that surgery. I I'm gonna have to stop you there for a second. Now you, you use medical terminology, that's everyday usage for you. Mm. If you can explain when you said category three maxed out for three hundred. Category three is a non-emergent elective surgery. So so something that needs to be done but doesn't need to be done today. So something that's that's painful but not life-threatening? Like a gallbladder. Like a gallbladder, knee mm. hip replacement, things like that. Yes. Tonsillectomies, so, um, grommets, those sorts of things. So waits of more than 365 days for those? They will try and get them in by that period but usually it will be up to that limit. So what about um, people who need cataract surgery and things like that? How, do, how What are the waits like? For an Indigenous person out here? We've been a lot more lucky uh, with the eye surgeries of late. We have had a public clinic that we can send those patients to, so the waiting list on average is around three months, if I recall correctly. Um, but prior to that, it could be quite lengthy. How about tonsillectomies for little kids who can't so swallow? If they're more urgent, they get increased up the categories. It can be quicker, but they do average out that 12 months. Now, what about um, young mums, bubs, that kind of stuff? Now, Aboriginal babies have a lower birth, birth rate, more, more challenges to that. What's the experience in Western New South Wales? We do have a great team at the AMS with a midwife and a child and family health nurse that helps us with a lot of our antenatal care. Um, and we do have partnerships with the antenatal clinic at the Dubbo Base Hospital and um, the Amos girls that see the, uh, the mums and bubs in the community. Now, what about kidney dialysis? dialysis and respiratory. I'll give you an example. We've had, this is our fourth day of hearings. We had one in Sydney, one in Cobar, and Deniloquin. And we were down in Deniloquin, and the renal chairs in the dialysis center were being used three out of seven days a week. So what, what about kidney dialysis in the community here, ac in Aboriginal access? Um, I can't speak for the, the dialysis unit themselves, but as far as my patients, I've had a pretty good experience with the dialysis unit, actually. Um, a lot of my clients will have access to dialysis at the hospital, and I also have one lady that has her own dialysis machine at home with great support from that unit for myself and for her when anything goes wrong. Okay. Now, what about... Um, okay, so the, uh, the double Aboriginal medical service, uh, what is your, your blanket or your sweep? How far do you go up? 
So we cover. Um, Can you speak into the microphone? We cover a lot of the smaller surrounding areas, such as Narromine, Peekul. Um, we have patients coming from Ningen, Gilgandra. Um, from Warren. From they come Warren. from Ningen and Gilgandra. They, yep. they drive in. How long would that? What would be the longest trip? So Ningen would be about a two-hour drive. Two-hour drive. And I've got a patient that will travel three hours to and from Dubbo to come and see me. So, but would they pass MPSs and other health facilities? Why would they? Why would they come to your facility? I think because of the culturally appropriate care that we offer. Um, and quite often, once you build a rapport with a patient, um, they will make that effort to travel further to come and see you in an area where they feel comfortable and supported. Right. Okay. So we also have Aboriginal health workers in a, um, and a team of nurses that will um, triage and do their um, post appointment with it. So that makes it a lot better for the Now, patients. what about Indigenous workforce issues? Um, are there areas where you're able to... I, 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 I know that you're, an you're a doctor of Indigenous descent. Mm -hmm. are, there, are there many Indigenous doctors out here? Um, my cousin works in the emergency department. <laughs> so um, the family business. Right? That's about it at the moment. We do have about 250 Indigenous GPs in Australia, but we're yeah. spread across a broad range of areas. Okay, but workforce issues such as nurse, nurses, community liaison officers and things like that, is there, is there scope? Do you have enough? Do you need more? What's the state of play? No, I think we have quite enough with the nurses. It's always easier to recruit nurse and staff and Aboriginal health workers. Okay. Now, has COVID had an impact or an unusual impact on Indigenous health in Western New South Wales? Absolutely. I think early in the pandemic, we found there was a lot of fear um, around COVID. So we did miss a lot of um, opportunity to perform those health checks on patients because they were socially isolating even without directives. So to get them in for their regular health checks, we did have a bit of trouble early on in 2020. Um, since then, that has picked up. So yep. we are picking up um, those patients and doing their screening checks again. That probably picked up around August last year. Um, there was also a bit of difficulties in sort of the teething process of doing telehealth early on as well because um, the Indigenous population, like I suppose the rest of the population, do appreciate the face-to-face -face consults yeah. um, and with the constantly changing recommendations um, and their constantly fluctuating threat levels, it became too difficult to do a lot of face-to-face -face consults early on. Um, but I think we handle it pretty well. I think after a while everyone sort of got used to the idea and we do sort of a mix of telehealth and face-to-face -face now right. um, and it seems to be, um, seems to be working. Now, what about the challenges of um, vaccinations for Indigenous people involving COVID? Um, are there, are there, you're, you're smiling or laughing or raising your eyebrows. Uh, Hansard, unfortunately, doesn't record that, so if you could articulate. Your, oh, yes. Your um, I, initially, it did go really, really well. I do run a COVID vaccine clinic two days a week. Um, just juggling the workload to be allowed to do those vaccine clinics was difficult initially because we don't have enough medical staff. Um, but the first couple of clinics I did run, everyone was really keen to get them done. They were very excited. We usually have fantastic vaccination rates within our community. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, more recently, with a lot of the media attack on AstraZeneca and the the clot risk and constantly hearing about it on social media. Um, certainly the vaccination clinics haven't been as busy as what I would like them to be. Mm -hmm. um, so that's sort of a place where I tend to get a lot more of those acute appointments because um, everyone's a bit fearful. Okay. What about mental health services? That is severely lacking in our community. Um, I would like to see more culturally appropriate uh, psychology services. Um, and by that, also affordable services. Um, we do have a great service through Marathon Health, but unfortunately, I find that most of my patients are either far too severe or far too acute to be accepted into that service. So, so what happens to, that, to them? My referrals get rejected. Say that again? My referrals get rejected. Okay, so what happens to the patients? I, I, it's uh, not a reflection on you. I, mean, what I happens to tend patient? to have to do the counselling myself or seek alternative arrangements. Um, we do have an... A, a, on average, about an eight-week wait for a private psychologist. Unfortunately, a lot of my patients live below the poverty line and can't afford the out-of-pocket cost to see a private psychologist, especially given you do need to see them on a regular basis. So for a lot of my patients, they just do not have the ability to pay privately. 
Um, so what do they do? Do they do the first Medicare approved ones and then follow it? That's only a rebate. It's not, um, it's not a free service. It, you might get a rebate from it, but you would be paying around $80 out of pocket on average. So for a lot of my patients, that is just inhibitory. Um, like I said, the service that is covered by... Um, so you step in yourself? Hence the waiting list. Hence the waiting list. <laughs> Okay, um, now, now, what about people who are battling ice addiction, treat, treatment in that the, area? The patients with dual diagnoses are another difficult issue, is that quite often if you refer to, say, drug and alcohol, for example, they'll be sent back saying we need the mental health sorted. Um, if you send to mental health, it's, oh, sorry, they need their drug and alcohol sorted. So it's very difficult to find someone that can manage both of those issues simultaneously. Um, and like I said, quite often, if you can't get them into one of those allied health services um, to help support their mental health, a lot of that does fall back on the GP. Um, certainly with my patients, a lot of them have got complex PTSD, uh, which is post-traumatic stress yep. disorder, uh, childhood trauma, intergenerational trauma from stolen generation. Um, fortunately, we have found a counsellor for our um, stolen generation clients, so mm -hmm. we do have that service now. Um, but when it comes to sort of the schizophrenic patients, the more complex patients, the suicidal patients, there is a huge hole that we, we can't fill. Now, Ms. Keed, there must be gaps that you see as an administrator or a person who is, um, what, what are the gaps that you have and you that need to be addressed in, in Indigenous um, health services? Like Amy was just saying, we, are, um, we do have the gaps of not being able to access psychologists. We were granted the funding to do so, yep. but we just can't get anyone to fill that position. Um, so that makes it hard on our patients, again, like Amy was saying. So again, what do you do then? So, uh, do Dr. Perry, so, so... So it means more frequent visits with the GP. We can do GP counselling. Um, I offer support for my clients. I will link them in with one of our health workers to offer that sort of pastoral support and just to check in and make sure they're going okay. Um, and quite often, again, it does just mean more frequent reviews with myself, um, just to see how they're going, offer a bit of basic CBT therapy. But we're only talking about a, a, a CBT, short... Sorry, oh, sorry cognitive, cognitive behavioural, behavioural therapy. therapy. Yeah, yes. yeah. Thank you. But we're, but we're only talking... Are we talking about a session, a typical GP, GP session that would be 6 to 15 minutes, depending on... Fortunately, I've been lucky enough to have 20-minute sessions with you my do clients. Um, I sometimes don't find that adequate. I would like longer with these mental health patients, but again, when you've already blown out to six-week waiting lists and we have such a big community, it's just not an option. I do want to see my kids sometimes. <laughs> so what's a typical work week for you? It's Monday to Friday, yeah. um, and we start around sort of 8.30, quarter to 9, if I get anything from the farm early enough, um, and then I'll work through um, officially seeing patients till 5, but I may be back until 6.30. Um, Ms. Chair? You're finished? Yep. yep. Thank you. Um, I've just got a few questions uh, for Ms. Chandler. Um, uh, Dr. Perrin mentioned that um, a lack of culturally appropriate health services existed around the, the psychology sort of space. Um, you also identified this as an issue within your submission. Um, can you tell us a bit more about some of the issues that you've noticed coming up um, and any areas that you think need urgent intervention and assistance? Okay, so I've bought a box with me today and that's basically filled with people that have registered with us over probably the first four months that we opened. And one of the main things that we did when someone registered with us was we did a health check on them. And that health check covered everything from emotional, physical, sexual um, and mental health. And then we come up with a plan to help that person bring those barriers down in whatever way they were being affected. The most important thing that we found is that they felt unlistened to. So it didn't matter wh where they were going or who they were seeing, or they had had a bad experience with somebody due to their health and hadn't gone back. 90% of people felt as though going to the doctor just meant they were going to be prescribed a pill or a tablet and sent out the door or that they were having multiple appointments and not understanding the reasons why, so they wouldn't go back. So their health care had been extremely badly affected over a long period of time. Now, what we do at Indige Connect is a holistic health service. So we concentrate on physical health first. Is this person not doing anything? Are they not physically active? What can we do to support them to become more physically active? Has this person fallen through the cracks? Now, 
I, I can think of three people straight off the top of my head who have absolutely traumatic health issues and ice addiction is definitely the outcome from it. But the main issue that they have is childhood sexual assault and it has been completely untreated. Now, one person in particular, I'm just going to call him Jay, his childhood sexual assault led to him offending the first time at 14 doing an armed robbery so that he could go to juvenile detention to get away from the person that was assaulting him. Now, his medical records, because part of him engaging with our business is we get their medical records, his medical records right back to when he was 12 years old detail that he had been sexually assaulted over and over again. Yet there was no health care put in place. Monday this week, he came back to my office and he is now ready to tackle that assault. Because through working with us through IndigConnect over the last seven months, doing what is appropriate, taking him to the doctor, getting his medication right, taking him to rehab, working with the justice system, doing all of that made no difference to his life and his offending. He had a five-week break from our service and in that time he's re-engaged with the justice system. Come back in and he said to me, Anne-Marie, I'm ready to do this, but I'm only going to work with you. Now, why is this person who has been engaged with the justice system and the health system since they were 12 years old, detailed this over and over again, only going to come in and work with me? Another one that I dealt with, um, I, I, she had been engaged over and over again with the justice system and the health system, extensive medical records. The culturally appropriate service that I provided her with after being expelled from every service here in Dubbo, including emergency housing, therefore rendering this woman completely homeless, was I just said, she needs to go home, back to her community, back to her family, because she was from another state. Having her here in our, in our life, in our world, was damaging her spirit. So her cultural needs were not being met and she was not being respected as an Aboriginal woman. Now, giving you details, she had an OT report that said she couldn't cook. That woman could cook. I seen her cook. But when I asked her why she didn't tell the OT she could cook, her response, and I'm going to swear, is she didn't want to tell that white cunt. So we need to be realistic in the service that we are providing that needs to be suitable for Aboriginal people. Another woman I've worked with, unfortunately, um, she's gone. Traumatic ice use. Um, I said to her in my office when she come back in for help, now, you're scaring me. The way that you're behaving right now is scaring me. And she looked at me and said, I'm not trying to scare you. I want help. And I said, well, I'm trying to help you, but you're not listening to me. So sit down, stop doing what you're doing and tell me what's wrong. And she sat down and said, nobody cares. And I said, well, let's go up to the hospital, put you in for the six weeks to help her dry out and then get her the help. Her medical records, again, detail that right back to, from when she was four years old, sexually assaulted. Yet the service isn't there as a, in a holistic way to help her. Cultural needs aren't being met or respected. They go to services treated like they're just a junkie. I absolutely hate that word. Their psychiatric needs are met, but they're given a pill and told that that's going to help them. Where's the psychology? It is not there. It's not available. Working with health, physical health, mental health, that means loving people to good health, not locking them up in jail, not giving them a pill and sending them home where they've got nowhere to go because they're homeless, but actually working on physical health, mental health, and making them safe is what can make the difference because I've seen that work with many of our clients. Um, but it is difficult because the services aren't there and financially they can't afford it. It, it sounds to me like um, from your experience and with the people that you're working with that because there isn't that culturally appropriate health care that people are then sort of falling into the justice system um, as a result of that? Is that what your experience has been? A hundred percent. So inter intergenerational trauma, trauma experienced from colonisation is not acknowledged. It's been a health issue and it 100 percent in the Aboriginal community needs to be acknowledged. There is no doubt 
that if you grow up in an Aboriginal community and you have experienced that life and been a part of that, then that definitely is something that affects our physical and mental health. And unfortunately, nowhere in the healthcare system is that acknowledged. So part of what we did to start with, and I'm just going to show you something because I think I actually think it's really important. So my business model that I started starts with taking an Aboriginal person working on their health, which is all the things I talked about, their financial assessment. So establishing where they are sitting financially. Do they understand money? Have they got extremely amounts of debts? Now, almost so many people have a debt that they owe for a phone or a power bill. Okay? But part of it is connecting back to culture. So showing people how they can be a strong Aboriginal person because there is nothing wrong with them in our community and showing them how they can work with services to overcome their health issues. So going to a doctor, I need help, this is happening to me. Here, take this pill. I've sat there and said to the doctor, this person doesn't want to be prescribed a pill. They want to see a psychologist. The doctor actually turned around and said to me, I am the professional here, I'm the one with the training. And I said, I'm the advocate, this is the patient, and you don't realise it, but you actually work for that person. So do the mental health plan so we can access psychology. Definitely. Thank you. I, I've just got one more quick question uh, for Dr Perrin. You mentioned that you've got a six-week waiting list, um, and I think your statement was, I'd like to see my kids sometimes. This is something we've heard a lot about during this inquiry, is the pressure when there's only one person doing a particular role and the pressure that that puts on that particular person. You know, what is that like for you to be sort of trying to find that work-life balance? Well, I do have three beautiful boys at home and I'm also a farmer as well as a GP, so I do have responsibilities outside my service. Um, I would like to consider myself a dedicated GP. I work long hours at the office and I work long hours at home. Um, I would like to be able to do more, but I'm only one person. So you do take these traumatic stories home. I have a lot of these traumatic stories and I think being an Indigenous GP, I am privy to a lot of these stories that perhaps some of my colleagues may not be. They feel comfortable to open up. So I think having extra services in the community that we could refer to, knowing that our patients are getting the care that they would get if we lived in the middle of Sydney, would take a lot of that pressure off. But as a GP in a rural community with nowhere to send our patients, we do take that home. We take on a lot of extra responsibility that we wouldn't otherwise have to do. You know, so it can be hard and we do all work you know, within our limits of, you know, our training. Um, and you can get compassion fatigue. Mm. You know, when you're hearing about these stories of sexual assaults and DVs and childhood deaths and suicides every day, you can get compassion fatigue. And it can be difficult to have time to perform those self-cares when you are working such long hours. But it is something that, you know, I've trained to do. I've been doing this for 21 years from med school to now. You know, I trained to come home and help mob. So it is something that I, you know, am very passionate about and I would like to see more culturally available services but I think we all need to work together because we all have the exact same goal. Working against each other isn't going to solve the issues. Thank you. Uh, Ms Fairman. Thank you and thank you all for appearing today and for the very important work you do for your community. So I just wanted to um, just get a sense of the interaction between, I'll start with um, Dr Perrin and Ms Keat in terms of the Aboriginal um, uh, medical service, the interaction between yourselves and the local health district in terms of workforce planning and demand for Aboriginal people within the area, what does that look like? We do have quite a close relationship with the PHN and the LDH. Um, I did a bit of reading last night and read their submissions as well. Um, and I think it's across the board that we're all having the same issues with trying to attract staff and to retain those staff. So, I mean, we do quite often have discussions with them about, you know, attracting more speech pathology, more psychologists, more specialists. But they are working incredibly hard and still not getting anywhere either. Can I just get a sense of um, there's need and then there's actual positions and that there's two different things, I think. What, what's the mm. need and then there's the, the potential of actual vacancies and filling those vacancies. But the mm. question, I suppose, was around the 
um, the actually working with the LHD and talking with them about what is needed. So do you do that yourselves or is there somebody within the Aboriginal Medical Service that does that in terms of workforce planning, in terms of the need for the for Aboriginal communities here? Yep. Is um, there a dialogue that consistently happens? So if there are gaps, so for instance at the moment we are struggling to um, for our patients to see an ENT. Um, for one patient, it could be over $15,000. Our patients don't have that money because the patients are, work, are the ENTs are now working um, privately. Um, so we, myself and our CEO, have had uh, multiple meetings with the um, PHN to try to find source funding so that we can get, um, utilise an ENT to come to our clinic. Um, so wherever we find, see the gaps, um, we'll take that to the PHN and the LHD to see what they can do to help us. So at the moment, for example, where you say you don't have an ENT, which I would understand there'd be a pretty significant need for an ENT in an area like this with a high Aboriginal population. So you're suggesting there's a need, you're going to, you just say the LHD as well as the, the PHN and that conversation is ongoing, mm -hmm. but at the moment there's no at the moment, uh, funding um, for that? At the moment, just recently we've been giving a small amount of funding um, so that we can, we can utilise that funding for the gap fee, which is um, $150. So that would mean that our patients would have to pay the $150 per visit, but we'll pay that for them with that funding. Yeah, okay. Um, Ms Chandler, I just wanted to thank you for can, your can contribution I, so far. No, would you like to I comment on that on as well? Can I that last yep. question you asked? Um, when you said what, what's the need there and what is actually available and who fills that gap, one thing that I've um, identified in what we do very strongly is that there's, there's a need for somebody to sit with an Aboriginal person when they visit the doctor. Now, I know that that sounds way over the top or whatever, but I can guarantee you in my experience, and I'm going to use one example of somebody who was diagnosed with hepatitis C. So they went to the doctor regarding their treatment plan and the doctor said to them, well, this can kill you. So that was then the trigger for that person not to want to go back or not to seek treatment for something that is perfectly treatable and to leave. And that was definitely a language, a cultural barrier. So um, other examples where people go for psychology and the person was asked, how long have you used drugs? And he responded, my whole life. And the, the psychologist said, well, well, that wouldn't be right because your mother wouldn't be putting it in your bottle. So I, on both occasions, I've then contacted that service and said, you know, culturally, that would have been for that person's whole life. That's how we talk when we do something. We've done it our whole life or whatever. So... It's just so small things that seem so tiny. But when I've sat with a person and they've, I've seen their reaction and then been able to smooth it over for them, they'll actually continue on with their treatment rather than being impacted, leaving and not going back. So from what I can see in my experience, having someone support an Aboriginal person to an appointment would be an absolute need that's not been met and it would reduce impacts of other health issues from not seeking their treatment. Yeah, we do have, for example, we have a submission to this committee that, to this inquiry from the Aboriginal Health and Medical Research Council that yep. highlights the fact that um, the number of ab Aboriginal patients who discharge against medical advice yeah. because they don't want to, they, they don't feel safe or there's no culturally appropriate support yep. within those hospitals. Would you like to expand on that? Yes, that absolutely. I can guarantee that that happens. I've spent hours in my own time on the phone to someone who was... Uh, the, sorry, it's really hard for me not to get upset, but anyway, I'm just going to keep it's talking. Okay. It's all right. Yeah. Um, the doctor next door kept coming in about this person's health um, and I worked extensively for him to stay in hospital and get treated before he actually passed away. So if he didn't stay, he would have died. Um, and that included getting family members to come and stay with him. And, and also the other thing that we have to be realistic about is allowing him to leave hospitals so that he could go and use drugs and come back and finish the treatment. So. You know, and things, other times where people have um, 
a long way away have been to the doctor and, for want of a better word, gone off their head because they'd said something and they were responded to in a poor way. Um, and then that person saying, you know, ring Anne-Marie and then rang and I sorted it out and they seen their treatment. But yes, um, not being understood or respected when you feel that way, you're already in a traumatic situation when you're going to seek help. So yes, we need more. We do hear from the LHD as well as the hospitals that we have visited during this inquiry about the fantastic Aboriginal um, support workers or mm -hmm. Aboriginal yep. health workers that are within those hospitals. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, we visited um, uh, yesterday was Wellington, for example, and there was uh, one there um, who was working at the time we visited. So that's something, isn't it? Are that program, a... yes, that's mm -hmm. brilliant. I, I love that. I've actually worked with people to get into those positions as well um, in another hat that I wear. They're brilliant. They're um, fantastic. So more of them are definitely needed. More of them in yeah. terms of the the need to have more funding to put yes, more in to if they're, if more they're available. Yes. Dr Perrin? Um, I'd like to respond to that one as well, please. Um, I've been working quite closely with the Aboriginal health workers and the team, the discharge team at the hospital recently. I've had quite a few of my patients in hospital rather unwell. I think it is a great service. I do think that they have a fantastic role to play in the hospital, but I would like to see more of them. Um, that's the Aboriginal health workers. For a lot of my patients, when they do go to hospital, like anne -Marie said, they're frightened, they're sick. Quite often my patients won't, if they're getting sick, some of them will come in early, but others will leave it till they're on death's door before they come in because they know full well cranky old Amy's going to say go to the hospital. So by the time we go up there, quite often I will send an escort from the AMS with them, so one of our health workers to sit with them in the emergency department, knowing full well that if they're up there and they are treated poorly, which unfortunately some of my clients are, um, at least we've got that person to talk them down and get them to stay. Uh, once they're admitted, however, um, obviously our guys have to come home and there are those support workers in the wards. Um, unfortunately, however, when there are a lot of Indigenous patients admitted at any one time, they may not get to see the health worker in a timely manner. Um, we have, over the last uh, couple of weeks, I've had a patient of mine in hospital that is rather unwell and does quite often discharge early because she does feel unsupported and she isn't necessarily given the help that she needs. I have actually sent a couple of my nursing staff and AMS, uh, the AMS health workers up to just do a checkup, just to see if they're okay, change their clothes, just give them a bit of that sort of social support while they're up there so they can see a familiar face. Um, for some of my clients that, you know, I'm more close with or I've been treating for years and years, I'll actually give them a call myself after talking to the team just to interpret what has been said. Um, so I would like to see more of that in the hospital so that perhaps we wouldn't have to send our staff from the community um, and they can feed back as well if there are any issues that, you know, I'm more than happy to bring them up and just have a chat, but there needs to be that person to actually give me a call and say, heads up, such and such is not doing well today. Thank you. Thank you, uh, the Honourable Natasha McLaren-Jones. Oh, thank you oh, very sorry, much. sorry, Ms. Oh, Key, did you have something further so to say? Just with our patients, um, a lot of our patients, they won't, they won't go to the hospital. So they'll, they will con constantly call us, can I please see the doctor there, I don't want to go. They, we could have patients that are having a heart attack and they won't go to the hospital. We had one last week. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that, that this is a barrier that needs it needs to be closed now because our patients are, are dying, waiting to get their service, health service at the hospital. Um, they won't go to the hospital because of the way that they are treated, because of the colour of their skin. They won't go to the hospital because they are left in their beds for days without even having their sheets changed. No one has visited them, as in Aboriginal health workers. Um, and this is, I feel like this is something that needs, there needs to be something done about this now. I actually had a client of mine a couple of days ago say to me that she wouldn't go back to the hospital because she's sure if she turned up unconscious they would think she'd overdosed. She hasn't used in eight years and she has actually had a missed heart attack because she was put in the waiting room as a malingerer. And, and that, that is pivotal too. If somebody has overdosed, it doesn't mean that they deserve any less treatment course, than anybody yeah. else. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Natasha. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you all of you for um, coming today, and particularly um, uh, Ms. Chandler for the advocacy work that you do. 
Could you explain to the committee um, the important role of uh, bush medicine um, in mental and physical healing? So I'm not across bush medicine, so I'm not going to speak on that today. Um, but I can guarantee that for Aboriginal people, holistic health service is what we need. So I, I talk to people in this way, and I'm sure everybody has something different, but the people that I talk with, I say this. If you are afflicted by white man's ways, you use white man's ways for treatment. So what I mean by that is if your issue is alcoholism or, say, childhood sexual assault leading to drug addiction, then you need psychology to help you with that so that you can work through the CBT and all of that stuff and unpack that and deal with the emotion that comes from that. Along with that, you also need to reconnect to who you are as an Aboriginal person with black feet on this soil in this country. So that means going out bush, spending time with, with mother on, on soil in peace. We live in such a fast-paced world that is not natural and it disconnects us from who we are. So taking ourselves out, sitting near water, having that self-care as well, then going to the doctor and working through that health issues also. So it works hand in hand, not as two separate entities. Dr Perrin, would you like to comment on that and, and the ways it could be integrated more into, um, uh, I suppose, with doctors and healthcare delivery? Um, I suppose I'm in a bit of a privileged position because quite a few of my clients actually do practice bush medicine. I have a few shrubs at my place that we um, do utilise from time to time. And I have a bit of a you know, understanding of how some of these things work. So quite often I'll ask them what they are using, what they're using it for. And that can give me a bit of a sneaky history as well as to what's going on for the patient. You know, what are you using this paste for? Why are you on Gumby Gumby? You know, and it can lead me to diagnoses that we may not necessarily have come across. Um, and certainly a lot of the bush medicines, I think we do use them as an adjunct to Western medicines as well. So I have no issue with them using, you know, their home remedies and the bush medicines in addition to, you know, things like their thyroxine for their thyroid disease. Um, we've also had a um, couple of visits to town by the Nangari um, from Central Australia that have helped us a bit with smoking ceremonies, um, getting in contact with culture. Um, and it's, it's been pretty widely accepted, hasn't it, Jamie? Everyone was really excited when these guys came. Um, and that was all organised by our social and emotional wellbeing unit as part of the AMS. Um, and they also do quite a lot of cultural activities with the guys as well. So I know Phil was organising some carving and um, just sort of yarning sessions with the blokes just to get them back and centred. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yep. Uh, thank you very much uh, all for appearing today. Uh, Dr Perrin, if we could clone you, I think we'd have half our problems solved because we'd have um, you know, a ready supply of people that, that understand um, this area and, and, and doctors. Sorry, but sorry, Member, could I just get you to go a bit closer to the uh, microphone? Apologies. I don't think people uh, that can hear But in, it, seeing as we can't do that, how, how, do we, how do we do that? How do we get more... <laughs> Little sorry. Uh, how do we do that? How do we, um, how do we get more people who are um, growing up, you know, in, in Western New South Wales to, to uh, go and study medicine, but, but have that, that, um, that desire to come back and, and provide those services to, to the people which they grew up with and, and have that a connection and affinity to? Um, I'd love to get back out to the schools chatting to some of our young people again. I did find um, when I was doing that regularly, we did have a lot of young ones that were actually quite passionate about going into the medical field, whether it be nursing, medicine, paramedics. Because um, I know growing up, look, I wasn't expected to do anything either. My year 10 teacher told me I was going to be barefoot and pregnant at 16, so she wasn't going to mark my assignments. That's right. My Good on you. <laughs> my chemistry teacher told me I was so lazy I'd marry a pregnant woman. So I think we've got, we've got some, you know, affinity. But yeah, go on. That's it. So I think just giving the power back to the kids. Kids. Um, I'm very passionate about ear health, which is why I kept mentioning the ENTs. Yep. A lot of our kids drop back in education because they're deaf. Yep. Um, I myself have had three sets of grommets because um, I was deaf through school with glue ear as well. And I think when you are deaf and you're bored and you can't pick up things in class, you tend to play up and you get labelled that naughty kid and no one wants to teach you. Yeah. So by the time our kids get to high school, there's quite a lot of illiteracy issues, behavioural issues, wagging, because... It's not cool to be the kid that can't read. You'd rather be the rough one or the bully so that nobody torments you. Um, so I think focusing on education of our young people, first and foremost, getting those services for speech pathology and ENT so that our kids aren't starting behind from kindergarten. Um, like I said, getting out there and telling our kids that they can do it. They are smart, we are deadly, we can do anything that anybody else can do. 
but also once you get to that point where you've gone through secondary school, I'd like to see an undergrad program for medicine in Dubbo. Yep. Um, Post-grad medicine is great, but you're not going to get a whole lot of Indigenous guys into that course. You know, we need the undergrad stuff. I'm more than happy to mentor these guys. I'm more than happy to offer support, but we need that undergrad. You need to harness that passion while it's still there. You know, I was young, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed at 17 when I went to uni yep. because it was what I wanted to do and I had great mentors. I'd like to see those services here in Dubbo so that we can capture those clever kids, get them out doing what they need to do. And these guys aren't going to leave home. This is country for me. I'm exhausted and my batteries are flat when I'm anywhere else. I need to be home to help mob. Yeah, and, uh, and it's a great story. And, and as I said, we, well, it's what we need to do more of. And, and I think you'd obviously be aware that, you know, we're, we're looking at putting these rural medical schools so people can do their undergrad studies in, in mm. rural regional locations. Um, how do you see what it is that we're doing now? And, and how do you see um, what, what outcomes that might have into the future, knowing that, you know, obviously... Yeah. So we do have to address that issue first. I think if you do your internship and your residency in a rural hospital, you mm -hmm. tend to get the bug. You know, you mm -hmm. love it out here, you realise that we actually are awesome people out here in the bush, and a lot of these guys will, you know, buy houses and have families out here because it is a much nicer place to raise a family than it is in the smoky old city. Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> and you, you're, you're talking my language, absolutely. <laughs> Um, just on the issue of uh, cultural, cultural appropriateness, um, now, you know, I've heard some divergent views just a little bit, even today, um, around, you know, how we, how we address that. And, and, I, and I think it is uh, one of those issues that we need to, um, I guess, focus on because um, it, it's breaking down that barrier. Now, um, you know, we've heard uh, from Ms Chandler about, you know, how she views it. Uh, what's your perspective, I guess, from, um, from the, the AMS perspective, but also um, just hearing some of what you were saying about uh, the interactions that you may have had, or your, your, your patients may have had, um, and what, what it is that you think we could do better? Um, I think when it starts with culturally appropriate training for um, medical personnel and you know, for hospital staff, for example, it needs to be local. Um, I know when we did the cultural training for GP training, we learned a lot of, um, you know, don't make eye contact, don't name the dead, blah, blah, blah. That's okay for the Northern Territory, but that's not Wiradjuri. That's yeah. not how we do things here. So yeah. if you're behaving in that way towards an Indigenous person, they're going to think you're a goose. Yeah. So you need that local culturally appropriate training. Um, but I think for me, it just comes down to treating the person like they're human. You know, yeah. I don't care if you're the Queen of England or you've, you know, you live under a bridge. You know, yeah. you're a person and you need help. And quite often, I think people with drug abuse issues, with alcohol issues, with homelessness, they need us more than anybody because they don't have the you know, ability to get help for themselves. And just treating people like they are equal, like they are human, is a really good first step. And that's something I think is really lacking in um, medical services is just that unconscious bias. You know, you just want to get that person out of your room as quickly as possible. Um, I can't speak for my other GP colleagues, but I tend to run my clinics very casual. You know, I like to get to know the person, yarn a bit, find out about their background. So when they come in, I can ask them, you know, how's Arnie Joan going? Or, you know, how'd you go at the footy on the weekend? Yeah. As a great icebreaker. And I think and that goes a long way. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Ms Key, do, do you sort of have um, some views on that as well? Uh, um, I agree with Amy. We do need that cultural awareness training. It needs to be compulsory. We have um, students that come out to us and they don't know anything about yeah. the Aboriginal culture. Yeah. Um, which is appalling. And, and do you find that needs to be localised as well? Like, yes. Um, yeah. yes. So, so, I mean, so, I'm from Wagga, so I, you know, I live in Wagga, and you know, it's always a Wiradjuri country as well. So, yep. you know, uh, and um, I, my wife was a doctor, so um, she, paediatrician actually, so she did a lot of work with the, the, the local item. Well, no, <laughs> uh, no she, I think she's, she's very, very comfortable in Wagga, <laughs> but, um, it, you know, it, it's, it's, um, it, it is that, it's that local knowledge of, you know, cultural appropriateness, and, and, and it, it does differ, doesn't it? Yeah, it definitely does. Yeah, uh, Ms. Chandler, um, do you do you sort of agree that um, it needs to be a really localised focus on um, you know the, the the traditions and culture of of, of the people um, in the local area as opposed to a broader training? I think it's difficult to um, to. For, I, I think it's really difficult for people to understand if they if they've never lived in. Um, an Aboriginal community, okay? Mm -hmm. They don't understand it. So I, I grew up in community, so I don't really... I've been in community and in, in different parts of society as well. Um, and 
I make myself fit in wherever. I don't, I'm me and you don't like me, I don't care. But when you have medical treatment and you have, like, can I just give you an example? So when I moved to Dubbo, I moved over into Yoruga Street, right? And I worked at Centrelink at the time. Now, it was great. I loved it. I lived in that street. But pizza didn't even get delivered there, mm. right? So you, ha you have two different perspectives on what being an Aboriginal person is. Mm. So where, where's the balance with medical people? Yeah. Right? So if, if they're seeing this is what's broadcast in the news, rah, 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 um, ABC did this thing years ago, I think it was called something like When the Natives Go Wild. Well, I was there when that happened. And to me, that was nothing like what they portrayed on TV. People who are working in our medical system have these views on people they're supposed to be providing care to improve their medical health. Cultural awareness training is absolutely imperative to the health care of our people. But it has to be appropriate, like Jamie said, yeah. not Northern Territory stuff coming down here. Yeah. It's got to be from this community, people going out and actually experiencing. And, that, and that's the real value we get around uh, uh, having these, I guess, re regional hearings and, yeah. and going to different communities because we're, we're certainly hearing that. And I, and I think that's something that we need to, to look at. And, and not, not just uh, it's sort of in, in, for the Indigenous culture, but, you know, all the cultures, because you know, obviously, um, you know, you can probably see by my surname. I'm, you know, I'm from Chinese heritage, and um, you know, it's it's understanding all those different heritages. Um, you know, when when somebody attends a medical service, which I think is really important. Um, you talked briefly about work-life balance, and um, you know, it's, uh, having seen the medical side from you know from one perspective, uh, I understand how difficult it is. Um, can you talk about uh, how you find? Uh, the pressures of, um, I guess, living in a small community where you might see your patients and then um, you're in shopping and then you see your patients again. It, 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 it can be quite um, uh, encompassing, can't it? It can. Um, and certainly I grew up in Dubbo as well, so quite often I know a lot of these people and have had for 30-odd you know, yeah. years. Um, I think you just, you build those sort of barriers when you first start up, like you put your boundaries in place. You know, when I'm shopping with my kids, I don't want to know about the rash on your bottom. Um, yeah. And my kids have been trained from a young age as well. They usually do that, oh, mum, can we go? Yeah. <laughs> so that we can actually get out and do our groceries. But yeah. most of my patients are really respectful in, um, you know, they'll give me a wave or, you know, come and say hello, but they'll usually leave well enough alone if I'm with my family. Um, and I... I was lucky enough to actually marry a non-medical person, so I did have a life before med school. Um, and he's very good at quarantining time as well. You know, I have my debrief time when I get home, and then it's, nope, you put your mum hat on now, we, you know, we're just having family time. Yeah. So we do make sure we have that quarantine time um, at the end of every day to, you know, just be mum. Sounds like, sounds like you could um, provide um, some, some guidance for a few other people as well, because, uh, um, yeah. It, you, you've certainly got that balance, which is good. Um, and it's, it's very important for me. I'd like to raise well-adjusted Aboriginal boys as well. You know, they need their mother, they need that guidance, they need yeah. the snuggles at the end of the day. And I'm no good as a mother if I'm stressed and I'm tired and I'm not sleeping. So yeah. we have to make sure that we're very strict with, you know, leaving work at work. Yeah. The last question I've got is, is around, um, I guess, a clash of services. Um, so from, I guess, the Aboriginal medical um, service perspective, you, um, you would provide um, a service to, to your patients and, and the people that, 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 that come in to interact with you. Do you find that um, there's sometimes issues with, um, I guess, other people trying to provide similar services from a different perspective? Does it, does it create um, a friction with, with, your, um, with your patients? Uh, Instead of having like a single source of truth, they've potentially got others? Um, I haven't so much found that in, in Dubbo. I don't think we have enough services to overlap. Oh, and, um, yeah. but I, I'm thinking like advocacy, ag advocacy services and the like. like do, do, does that create an issue for you at all? Um, 
Sometimes there are, a, you know, there have been a couple of times that we've had um, different services come in and they've got their own agenda before they come into the room. But um, I'm usually pretty good at juggling that and just saying, look, this is this is what we need to do. Um, yep. I'm happy to work with you, but we need to be on the same page. Um, you know, if we're pulling two different directions, it's not in the benefit of the patient. So, so you you'll generally, I uh, guess, um, take the lead and lay down the law, shall we say? I've got three boys. I'm well trained at that. <laughs> Can I speak on that? Because yeah. I think um, what you said then was a very dangerous thing to say because it's up to the patient what treatment they want to seek. There's so much out there that people can um, take advantage of or use for their health care. And there's lots of different ways to prescribe that. There's lots of different thought processes on it. What works for one patient might not work for the other patient. Now, the, the, the most important thing that I explain to people when they engage with Indige Connect is that he, seeking healthcare is no different to going to the mechanic. You might go to one mechanic and he might fix everything that's broken with your car and you never have another problem and you just go back when you need service. You might go to another mechanic and drive out and your car's worse than what it was when it went in. Which you is, have the which... choice to seek the healthcare that you want. And that's really important because some people will go to one place, um, say a psychologist, and not get help and then not go back again because they, they have the assumption that everything's like that. We need to work together. All services need to work together, but we definitely need to let the patient know or the, the person seeking treatment know that they have choice and control over their own life. Which is absolutely fine, but what I was trying to get at was if you have a different service provider coming in with a client for a medical opinion, and their opinion differs with yours, in the end you are in the room for a medical opinion, and if that doesn't fit with the agenda, then you do go seek further yep. opinions. Definitely. I Thank you. That, I think that a lot of our patients are... Um, like an open book, they'll tell you if they've been somewhere else and then they will give us their consent to speak to whoever, like for instance, um, the diabetes um, clinic at the hospital. A lot of our patients, we have a diabetes educator attend, um, so we've um, built a partnership so that they're aware that at this patient has come down to see us and then we'll let them know what's going on with the patient's consent. So Thank you so much for um, coming today. Thank you. Thank you so much and thank you for attending this hearing um, and thank you again for the work that you're doing. Ms Chandler, I will get the committee staff to actually contact you about the, um, the flow chart um, to see if we can get a copy of that with your permission for the benefit of the committee so they'll speak to you after this. Um, but thank you all again. Um, we will now move to our next witnesses um, so I'll get them to come straight up even though we are running a little early. Um, I now welcome our next witnesses. Uh, could each witness, starting from my left, um, please state their name and position title and swear either an oath or an affirmation. My name's Vicky Kierens from Narromine. I'm a retired um, mother, grandmother uh, and daughter. I swear the evidence now, I'm now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thank you. And my name is uh, Dr Neil McCarthy. I'm a uh, GP in Narromine and previously from Warren. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thank you. Um, we now have a little bit of time for an opening statement. Do you each have an opening statement that you'd like to give? Yes. I'll start with you. Thank you. Um, I have lived in Narromine most of my life. 
In the 80s, when I had my children, our beautiful Narromine Hospital, we were able to give birth at by cesarean, natural. We had minor surgeries um, done there. My husband even had a um, fractured cheekbone repaired there. They were the types of things that were done in our local hospital. We had two GPs who were visiting medical officers and attended the hospital during the after hours, <coughs> weekends, to care for the patients of Narromine and, and district. We now have oh, four to six doctors, some part-time, at Narromine, beautiful Narromine Medical Health Centre, um, none of which are visiting medical officers at the hospital. We have a virtual doctor system operating out of our hospital, um, which when you consider 95% approximately of the patients that would be in Narromine Hospital are elderly palliative care patients. Um, technology is beyond them and this is the best that we can do for them. Um, my biggest concern with that is that the information doesn't transfer. You know, we have my health record. And none of the information, unless the patients, if you attend Narromine Hospital after hours, none of that information comes back to your local GP unless you bring the paperwork back, which a lot of patients don't bother doing. The, the duty of care isn't there to continue their health records. And anything could happen on that weekend and not be known by their local GP. It's not good enough. It's time that we, yes, we have beautiful hospital being built here in Dubbo, improvements beyond anyone's expectations for this area. But our local little hospitals in rural New South Wales need to be able to cater, especially for our elderly. They deserve better. I also have a letter to table, if that's mm -hmm. OK, um, on the mental health system. Um, I did my submission very quickly and I didn't include that in there, I'm sorry. No, no, that's fine. That's fine to table it. OK. Thank you. Uh, Dr McCarthy, did you have an opening statement you wished to make? Yes. Um, I'm a, uh, a rural GP of 30 years' experience. Um, I've uh, worked in Narromine now for the last six years. I also have an um, appointment to uh, the Lord's Hospital in Dubbo, which is a highly regarded and much loved service in Dubbo. And I'm also a, uh, have a clinical advisory role with the Western New South Wales Primary Healthcare Network, who you'll be hearing from later today. I don't represent any of those organisations today. I am appearing as a private citizen and I appear on behalf of the people that I have served in the communities of Warren and Narromine over an extended period because I have noted, particularly in the last two years, a dramatic deterioration in the, the level of care being received by them in this area. Um, Because I feel it's important for the committee to gain a deep understanding of the problems, I'd uh, like to table the document, mm -hmm. reimagining primary health care workforce in the rural and underserved settings. And I believe you've been given that document. Uh, I don't expect that you will have read it. I would encourage you to read it from cover to cover. But what you should know is that this document has been written by a gentleman called Roger Strasser, who is an authority on the development of rural health services in uh, underserved populations. He is an Australian and he's not a friend, he's not an associate, but his work has been uh, significant in this area. I urge you to uh, consider it and I urge you to use it in your um, or, or urge the committee to use it in the work going forward so that you can really understand what all the stakeholders might be trying to say to you and how best to um, 
reach a compromise between all the um, stakeholders that are going to be competing for your ears. So uh, I leave it at that for the time being. Wonderful. Thank you so much. We're now going to move to questioning. So we'll have questions from the government, from the opposition and the crossbench. Um, we will start with the Honourable Walt Seckord and each party will have 14 minutes. Thank you. Um, thank you for your evidence. Thank you for your time. Ms. Kierens? Yes. What was your late father's first name? Ronald. Ron. Ronald? Ronald. Rond. Yes. Rond. Um, I understand that he passed away on January the 4th, That's earlier correct. this year. Yes. If you don't mind, could you take us through the details, if you don't mind? Uh, not at all. My, my father was a very strong, independent man. He lived at home um, by himself, cared for himself. He was 92 and three months when he passed away. Did he, um, did he live by himself? He lived by himself in his own home. He did his own housework. Um, he did woodwork, um, making furniture, kids, kids' furniture, mm. uh, tables and chairs, things like that. He also repaired lawnmowers as an ex-mechanic. Um, he mowed his own lawn up until October, September, October, when he had a fall and I stopped him doing that, much to his disgust. He was very independent, strong. We um, went for an annual checkup in September. I took him to Dr McCarthy oh. because Dr Sam, his previous doctor, wasn't working anymore, or not full time anyway. Oh. Um, he hadn't been to the doctors for 12 months because the last time he went, 12 months in 2019, he lost his licence, which was uh, devastating be, because, for him. Because he was 91 then? He, he was unsteady on his feet and they were worried about him blacking out. So that was fair enough. But it, it was a big dead to his pride. Um, all through COVID, he moved in with us for the lockdown period. Um, we cared for him, had a wonderful six six to eight weeks with him, um, but he wanted to return home. So he went home. We went and saw Dr McCarthy in September to do his annual blood test, just to check that everything was OK. And unfortunately, it showed up that he had some type of blood cancer. Oh. According to the blood results, he should have been a very unwell man, but he wasn't. He was still living at home, taking care of so himself. So he didn't—he didn't know he had cancer until he, no. had, the until he had the blood test. No, no, oh, not okay. at all. And even then, he didn't believe it. And we saw an oncologist here in Dubbo, um, and he kept regular checks on him. Um, my father decided he didn't want any treatment. Mm -hmm. He felt at his age, he yep. just wanted the best quality of life he could have till the end. But this was all documented? Yes. Okay. Um, and come, mm, he, he, his blood tests were getting worse, but we had a big trip planned for Christmas up to my sister at Lennox Head. Mm -hmm. um, the Friday, and he was to leave the Friday before Christmas. Oh, he's gonna go with you? Yes. Oh. Yeah, okay. the whole family was going to Lennox Head for Christmas. So we were flying him up on the Friday before Christmas. On the Wednesday prior to that, we had a phone hook up with his oncologist. In, we, in Dubbo? In Dubbo. Yeah. And we got very bad news that his health was failing and he didn't consider him well enough to travel. So we had to do a quick cancel of Christmas, accommodation, everything. And we had Christmas at my house. In Narromine. In Narromine. So yeah. the whole, the family that were at Lennox was, were flying down. Oh. And even then, we were sort of a little shocked that he, he was so unwell because he was still living by himself, still looked fine. We provided meals for him, but he still did everything else for himself. My sister flew down from Lennox and spent some time and in those few days, we did notice a deterioration. 
Um, he was he made it through Christmas lunch, but Christmas dinner he he was really unwell. Okay. And the next day he asked to go to hospital. Oh, so he asked on Boxing he, Day. He asked Boxing Day. He called me over in front of all the family and said, "I'm really feeling crap. I think I need to go to hospital." Yeah. Um, so we called an ambulance, and he was taken to Narraman Hospital. Okay. Um, he appeared at the hospital to the nursing staff who were on duty who did not know him um, as a very old, frail man. Were there any doctors on duty at that time? No. So there were just nurses? Just nurses. Um, they admitted him um, and for some reason they could not get his records from oncology. I had no paperwork, but I had kept a record of all his levels. So did you inform them? Were you with him in the hospital? I was with him. Oh, okay. um, they would not take any notice because I didn't have formal paperwork of, you know, his white cell count, his platelet count, any of that. But you did tell them that he had I blood, did, I he did had blood cancer? Them. Yes. 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 Um, he was admitted, reluctantly, but they did admit him to hospital. Uh, can I say the nursing staff and housekeeping staff at Narramon Hospital are absolutely brilliant. I do not have an issue with any of those. Our treatment, the family's treatment, thinking COVID yep. regulations, you know, even though we couldn't all be there together, it was still wonderful so, treatment. So it's Boxing Day, you can't get any of the records from oncology in Dubbo? No, so no. what happened next? Um, the next day, I have a brother and two sisters mm -hmm. and a sister-in-law who was also very close. So between us, there was, except for the nights, there was two of us with him, 24, oh well, not 24. So you had good, seven. You had good family support. We had good family support there. Yeah. Even though it we felt when the first um, visit with the virtual doctor. The virtual doctor. The virtual doctor. So there, there wasn't a doctor at Narrabine. You had a camera. To, where was the camera? We had a laptop a that laptop. was wheeled into the room. And you can imagine how older did, people, hard of hearing. So how did your father contend with e-health, v-cameras? Not very well at all. He couldn't hear. He couldn't understand. Um, the virtual doctor had no concept of a rural hospital at Christmas time. So where was the rural, did you know where the, the virtual doctor was based? Was he a no. Sydney, Sydney, Melbourne? I have no idea, sorry. Okay, but he wasn't in the region? He wasn't in this region, no. Yeah. Because he wanted, um, because my father, it, it seemed to affect his legs. He wasn't able to walk. Mm. Um, he wanted physiotherapy for him, which in a rural situation over Christmas, there were no physiotherapists in Narramon on duty that could do anything with him. So then he suggested a virtual physiotherapist. For a 92-year-old man? Yes. Okay. Um, then, uh, because he, he spoke to my father, my father couldn't hear properly, we would have to relay yeah. anything that was being said. Um, and he asked my father, oh, well, have you got anything to say? And he went, I don't want to be here. And so the virtual doctor said, what, in hospital? Thinking that we had enough of him over Christmas time, we dumped him in hospital just to get a bit of family time away from looking after this frail man. What, so the virtual doctor hadn't been briefed properly? or Obviously didn't... not, or had no concept. Yeah. Um, and my father said, no, I don't want to be alive. Oh. Because he knew he was dying. <coughs> um, he'd had enough. He was in pain. He had terrible migraines. That seemed to be where the cancer affected. Um, so then he wanted to order a site psychiatrist to check him out. Um, he then ordered that, because he was a little constipated, he ordered that he would be taken to Dubbo Hospital 
on the, first, uh, on the Tuesday after Boxing Day to have a colonoscopy done to find out why he was constipated. This is a 92-year-old man who is dying of blood cancer. Now, I understand that your father passed away in early January, I think January yes. the 4th. Is that yes, correct? Yes, that is correct. So did he pass away in Narromine Hospital? Yes, he did. So what was your experience with, with E, with, sorry, I keep saying E, V, the, the video, the video health? So what happened was, after that? Was there a complete miscommunication? There was complete miscommunication. I feel half the time that the records, it seems sometimes that they, he didn't even know really the background of my father as being different from another patient with cancer in the hospital who also was dying at the time. Uh, we had a palliative care hookup with the wonderful Lord's Hospital. Can I say how brilliant and lucky we are to have it? Um, where they ordered a, a syringe driver. So he was in a lot of pain, so he had morphine. He, was, he, he had morphine. Only, only this was on the Tuesday. Yeah. Um, so any, any time before that, they would have to try and get in contact with the virtual doctor to be able to order more morphine for was my the, father. Was it the same virtual doctor or different ones? I have no idea. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I can't okay. tell you. Um, so Lord's palliative care nurse ordered that he have a syringe driver where he had the morphine being delivered on a regular basis so that he wasn't in pain. Yep. Um, I had to battle quite strongly with the virtual doctor to get that done. You were like arguing with the virtual doctor? Yes. Because he decided that my father could press the buzzer and request more pain medication. Was your father able to do that? No, he'd lost coordination of his hands. Um, he was asleep most of the time except when he cried out in pain. So if a physical doctor was in front of him, a physical doctor, doctor would be able to... Would, would have been able to see that. Right. Yes. Um, he even suggested the virtual doctor prior New Year's Eve told me that I could... I, my dad didn't have to be in hospital all the time. I could take him home New Year's Day to have lunch with us all. He couldn't sit. He couldn't walk. He had no coordination of his hands to eat. We would have to feed him. And when I said he all of this, he said, "Well, we can give you a walking uh, a wheelchair to take him, you know, to get him around at home." He was asleep all the time, except when he crawled, cried out in pain, and he couldn't see that that was what was happening. So. And, you, and your father passed away on January the 4th. January, uh, early hours, it was, yeah, about 1.30. And, and during the time of being admitted from Boxing Day until when he passed away, did he physically see a doctor in the flesh? Uh, I think there was one day that he did, a young doctor, I'm not sure of his name. He did see, I think it was on the weekend sometime, and how do you feel about the use of visual doctors, virtual doctors in countries? I think they're areas? appalling. I really do. I don't know whether it's the red tape stopping our local doctors being able to visit the hospital. I'm not sure of what that situation is, but we have wonderful hospital. A wonderful hospital. We have wonderful doctors in Naraman and who care for their patients. They really do. Can I ask you, what was the official cause of death of your father when he passed away? Um, it was cancer. Cancer. Right. Cancer, yes. Now, you've lived in Narromine all of your life? Yes, all oh, but two years of my all life. But two years. Yes. And your father virtually most of his life too? Yes. Have you seen a deterioration in the quality of health care at that hospital? Yes. Even from 2016 when my mother passed away, she had doctors seeing her on a regular basis in 2016. Mm -hmm. There has a, 
been a big, big decline. Do you feel that if you had a physical doctor there, that your father, that you could have provided more comfort to him in his final days? Yes, yes. It was terrible seeing him in pain. My sister is an ex-vet nurse, and she made the comment there that if that was her dog, she would be having police charges laid against her for letting it be in as much pain as what our father were, was in at times. Thank you, Ms. Thank Mrs. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank, Thank you. you so much for, for sharing all of this and, um, and having the strength to come and share your story with us. Um, I've just got one more question for you. Um, I assume you've sort of spoken to family and friends and people in the community about what, what has happened to you and your family. Yes. What, what has their response been? Has that sort of um, developed a real nervousness around the health care for their own families and friends? Yes, it definitely has. Um, a lot of people have uh, applauded me for putting in a submission coming forward um, because a lot of them are feeling that way. Uh, a lot of them are nervous about where, you know, at, at end of life for their elderly parents, mm -hmm. where do we go? Where's the best place to have them? You know, you want them close by where family members and friends can visit and say their final farewells. But, you know, that's it's not a humane way to look after them in those last few days. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Dr McCarthy, you've also been um, quite critical of the telehealth system mm. um, in your submission. You actually made the observation that when the clinical needs of the patient are undifferentiated, e.g. fatigue, um, there's a heightened risk of adverse outcomes for the patient. Um, you know, we've heard um, an example here today. Um, but for the benefit of the committee, have you heard of other examples or can you expand on that um, and some of the issues that, that you feel are con concerning with telehealth? Uh, yes. I've heard many examples like that. Uh, first, let me say, Ron was a lovely man and we uh, very sad to see him go. But, um, yeah, it, it's, it really is... Uh, very difficult for me to uh, measure how painful it is for the communities that I serve. Um, I can't uh, report enough how, uh, how serious this problem is. And uh, I think uh, the, the overwhelming feeling that this or the deployment of this service is, is leaving people with is that they now feel that the health service deems them not worthy of physical face-to-face -face health care. And I don't, I, I can't say that strongly enough. That's the impression I get. People are already seriously affected by drought and, and other hardships over a long period. And now they are served up this service. And, uh, and you use the, word, the term not worthy of proper health care. And then you also talk about the other pressures Mm. Um, do you feel that this is affecting the mental health of the community yes. as well? Yes, undoubtedly, undoubtedly. And uh, it's a very sad state of affairs. Um, going back to parts of your submission, um, you talk about that, that there's a lot of pressure on doctors um, and that doctors, uh, and there's other aspects that are turning doctors from moving off into smaller towns. Um, how are you finding that smaller town doctors are actually coping with the pressure um, of, of, of all of this, of these compiling health problems and the fact that there is little support for doctors? Well, I'm surprised, Vicky, that you weren't aware that I, I had resigned from the hospital. No, uh, I didn't and um, the, the circumstances that forced that resignation was, was largely personal. My mother was dying of cancer in Sydney and I have a, an autistic daughter, aged 18, who's recently, or at, in, in early 2019, she um, left secondary school and there was difficulty transitioning her into adult life. And this was putting enormous pressures on my family. And coupled with that, um, 
one of my colleagues uh, also decided to resign um, in late 2018. So coming into 2019, I was going to be the sole doctor on call at the Narromine Hospital with uh, supervision responsibilities for, I think, two trainees at that time. And uh, I'd been left in a similar situation when I was in Warren, when I uh, departed there in 2014, where I'd been a long standing provider of healthcare services. And I, I, was, I, I found it very difficult because while there were supports provided uh, to me, the, you know, the long incumbent doctor in Warren in, term, in, form, in the form of um, locums and other visiting doctors, uh, I, I was the, the go-to person in the community. And, uh, and it was very flattering that people uh, thought so highly of me, however, it, uh, a person has their limits. And so that was one of the issues that uh, you know, forced me to move from Warren to Narromine, which, which at the time when I arrived in 2016 had a large group practice, very supportive, and, and that slowly declined over several years. So that's my story. So, I mean, it sounds like there's just a huge amount of pressure and that, that, that there's no possibility for a work-life balance and that's what's actually pushing doctors out. Is that your experience? That's my experience. You've heard mm -hmm. it. I, list, I read the submission from the doctors in Deneliqua and the doctor who, had, who conceded she had no social life mm -hmm. you know, and who, in the middle of the night, couldn't name the drug that she needed but knew where to find it. I mean, this is... This is very sad stuff. This is dangerous stuff. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I was not going to work um, and potentially harm people in a service like that. Thank you. Ms Fairman? Thank you. I'll just uh, continue that line of questioning, Dr McCarthy. So we've heard, we, can, we do continue to hear reasons for the difficulties within um, uh, hospitals and, and rural and remote health. So, for example, attracting the right um, people or the fact that um, a very different type of young people are very different these days and have different expectations, um, for example, to be a rural uh, generalist um, GP. However, you said in your opening statement that just the last two years, things have deteriorated significantly. So it's not just the difficulty then with filling vacancies, because it's just two years. What, why have things deteriorated significantly, in your opinion, in your view, over the last two years? Well, I, I think because there hasn't been a, the physical presence of a doctor in, in Narromine for a lot of that time, you know, um, there, there's been virtual services, there's been um, irregular locum services, um, there's the, now what they call a virtual rural generalist service, and um, uh, so the, these services are well intentioned, but they're not as effective as, as what Vicky and I would both like to see mm -hmm. return to the, the hospital. And not just Vicky and I, I mean, there are many other people in the community who feel the same way. Yes, yeah, so has there, cause, because we have heard positive things, some positive things about virtual mm. services and telehealth, and I'm sure the uh, witnesses this afternoon will, um, will, will continue to tell us that. But has there, so has there been, in your view, the government kind of putting in place the virtual services and telehealth at the expense of in-person services or at the expense of um, GPs being physically in the room? Is that part of what's going on here? I, I think you'd have to discuss that with the, the health service. I, I, I don't know how you would expect me to understand what the rationale behind them deploying that service. I mean, they make the decisions about how they staff the hospital and how they run the hospital. I'm not sure that I understand your question. So do you think that enough is being done then to attract and retain um, GPs within areas like, for example, Narromine? 
I, I, I couldn't say. I don't know whether they're trying to re recruit or what, what. I don't know what they're doing. I don't, you know, I don't know. Sorry. I don't know whether they're actively trying to recruit a, a full-time doctor to the hospital. I don't know whether they decided that that's too hard or... I, I just don't know. I, you know, I'm just not privy to that information. Okay. So I'm asking because your submission where you talk about the role for virtual care, that it's basically there is a role for virtual care to enhance medical service delivery in northwestern New South Wales, but it is not at this point in time sufficiently mature or evaluated to substitute for face-to-face -face medical service provision. Sorry, I, I understand your question now. I, I mean, for Sorry. many for many years, I worked alongside virtual care in in, in Warren and and in um, uh, in Narrowmine. The uh, the virtual care I'm referring to there is where there's a doctor physically in the hospital, and you're, the, the um, re remote specialist has access to video <laughs> of the uh, patient being treated. And um, that's that's the vCare service, not the v not the virtual rural general service, which replaces the physical doctor. So that, so there's I think we should make that distinction. So I, I see a role for that support um, for uh, rural and remote doctors, uh, but I I don't see a role for the replacement. Yes, yeah. because your submission specifically states, and Mrs. Um, Kieran's, you probably have something to say here as well, but you do say that, regrettably, it's frequently the default medical service delivery methodology and therefore used in isolation. So the fear is potential, is the fear that this is going to become the default because it is getting too hard to attract doctors to regional areas? I feel, yes, that this, this is what's going to happen more and more. Because we are very fortunate in Narromine, we do have um, not as great number of um, full-time doctors as it was when Dr McCarthy came to town. Um, but we are getting more that are working a couple of days a week. We are very fortunate. I realise that because there are a lot of towns in the area that cannot get even one doctor to the practices. So yes, I think that that is the worry that it is going to be how we're going to do our our health system, you know, in rural areas. And you know, we all know that some some things are hard to see face to face. You know, I, in my letter that I um, tabled about mental health, I had, had a husband who suffers dreadfully with depression, anxiety, PTSD. When he first got unwell, he could hide it. Like, you know, to a virtual doctor, it, seeing him face to face, you wouldn't know that anything was wrong with him. And so there are diseases that you cannot diagnose through a camera. You need to be that hands-on. You need to know the patients. Dr McCarthy, what do you think the government could do to attract more? Your submission specifically talks about the rural general, generalist medical practitioner as mm. a solution mm. for rural health woes. Mm. What is your recommendation to the government to attract more people into those positions, if you could make those recommendations today? Well, I've also in my submission, I've talked about uh, how doctors are trained and, and doctors for rural practice are trained. And I, I mentioned the, the um, in current medical training, very few Australian medical schools that I'm aware of actually provide longitudinal clinical uh, placements, or basically long placements in uh, rural general practice. Mm. Okay, and and the, the research evidence would suggest that that you know creates doctors that are more likely to practice in rural areas if they get that experience in their undergraduate training. 
even more so if they're actually drawn, if those uh, students are actually drawn from rural areas and then exposed early to um, rural general practice. So I think I mentioned my, my understanding is that the James Cook University has that as part of their undergraduate program, long mm. clinical placements. So, so th of course, that's not, a, that's not a solution that's going to work today. That's going to work in five, ten years when those students graduate. So what do you do today? Well, um, it, it, that's um, very hard, you know, very hard. You know. awesome. mm. Thank you. But, Thank you. Uh, the Honourable Natasha McLaren-Jones. Uh, thank you. Just following on from that line of questioning, um, thank you very much for the additional information and the discussion paper that you provided. Uh, obviously, I haven't had a chance to read it in the uh, last sort of 20 minutes, half an hour. But one thing I did notice is they, um, uh, the author lived in Australia and then moved to... Uh, Ontario. Yeah, in Canada. Northern Ontario. Which had a similar, similar health to us. And I'm interested um, from this... Uh, the work that he's done uh, in relation to the retaining uh, recruiting of, of um, the medical health force, particularly into those rural areas. What's the difference or what um, differences have, did he find uh, compared to what we do here in New South Wales that we could learn from? Uh, I, I'm not over all the detail. I, I think that um, it, it would certainly be worthwhile reading the, the details of, of his um, paper. But I, I, I present the paper because I, I think it's going to be helpful for the committee to look at the situation we are confronted with and compare the information in that paper to where we're at. I mean, this Roger Strasser in developing the Northern Ontario School of Medicine has effectively reversed the, the problems that we now are confronting, in, particularly in Western, what I, what I see in Western New South Wales. And uh, he's no longer, I, I don't, as I say, I don't know him, but I, I believe he's now working in a rural health faculty in, um, somewhere in New Zealand. So he's left um, Canada after doing his good work. And, but I, I understand that the, the medical school is still running and still functioning on the principles that he established. So. I'm sorry I can't give you answers to that, but it's definitely there. And, and I, the other reason why I think um, we should look at this paper and not think, oh, this is just a whole new idea. I'm certainly not uh, suggesting that a new medical school be established. But what I am suggesting is that his work be looked at very closely, you know, line by line. It's, it, that paper is uh, very heavily researched and cross-referenced. There's evidence there, it, it works, and we, we can't ignore it. No, that's fine. We've got the uh, Department of Health uh, coming this afternoon, so we'll make sure they have a copy as well, because they might be able to do a comparison of some of the things that we're uh, doing and where we could look for improvement. The other one is in relation to the fit for purpose and the integrated health system. Do you have any comments on how what we do now could be improved to match uh, or look at um, lessons learned from, from his research? I. I think um, what, what I see is um, a lot of very good people in, di in different areas, you know, uh, sometimes working together, often working together, but I think we need to work together more and we need to be, have uh, clear goals and I, and I sometimes see that the, the goals are not clear, what, where we're headed, what we're trying to achieve. So I think there needs to be more of that uh, collaboration and uh, uh, setting long-term goals in particular. And uh, so these are very, I know these are general terms, but I, I think a lot of the elements are, are there in front of us. We need to work with what we have. And I think um, following uh, Dr. Strass's uh, blueprint, we may get to where we want to be. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'll hand over to my colleagues. Thank you for coming. Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you for coming today. And um, uh, Ms. Cairns, I just wanted to say um, I'm really sorry for your loss. I lost my father to cancer uh, in days leading up to Christmas. So uh, I've kind of got a shared experience, and it's been hard to listen to your story. But um, I, you know, I, I have an absolute sympathy for, for what you've um, you. gone through. And um, thank you for sharing your story. Thank um, you, uh, Dr. McCarthy. Um, I. Uh, 
had a, a read of your submission and I'm uh, hoping you could actually, I guess, expand a little bit more on um, what it is you think um, it, it is that we can do around um, that training that, that we're going to be providing uh, into the future with the rural medical schools. And I'm sure you're aware that, um, you know, we're looking to build uh, with the federal government um, rural medical schools in, in regional locations to train doctors there. Um, training them and getting them used to a regional area is one thing, but obviously there's the other component about what it is that they, they learn. Do you have some insight into that? You know, having been a rural generalist and, and what you think it is that um, makes a good rural generalist that, you know, can work out in the regions um, where they're not perhaps as supported as um, they might be in a metropolitan setting? Well, I think, uh, yes, I can share some insight. I, if you believe what Professor Strasser says, you, you will train your rural generalists in the field, mm. in, in community practice, you know, and, and that is, uh, when you read the paper, it's quite interesting because that sounds preposterous, it sounds ludicrous, and that's what he was confronted with. Um, when he he proposed his medical school, so uh, but it can be done. Mm. You know, there needs to be more people training in in general practice in in the regions. Yeah. And so I assume by looking at that um, model and and those ideas that that he's putting forward, um, there really is a, a requirement and incumbency on the staff that are already in those rural areas to provide that support to those trainees. Isn't well, there? this is this is the difficult thing that you know there, there may not be staff there. They, uh, they, they, it won't happen without a considerable effort and considerable support and considerable changes in the way mm. that business is done now. Business being the medical education. Yeah. So and and it may it probably won't happen, you know. But uh, but I think we should uh, you know perhaps hope that it will. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and look, I, I noted the, the responses that you gave to some of my colleagues' questions around uh, the vCare or, or, you know, the virtual rural generalist, depending on... And you made the distinction, which was really, I think, important um, mm. there. And, you know, there are distinct models. And, and I note that you, you would, would, that would, I guess, I want to say they were wanting to lead you down, uh, you know, being critical of it, but in some times you weren't critical of it. You said that there was, there was application for where it had um, good... Uh, good outcomes for patients. Do you think you might be able to talk to us about that and perhaps, um, I guess, elucidate that is it something that we could be possibly using to provide some of that support to, say, a new doctor in, in a rural regional setting that, that may not feel like they're getting the support from colleagues because they don't have that many colleagues? Oh, I, well, I, I could give you examples. Um... But I, I'm not sure. There's, there are many examples. It, it does work, it, you know, um, and, and and it would work in the scenario you're proposing. I mean, mm. it would. It is supporting. It was supportive for me when I worked in, particularly in Warren. Warren, yep. When it was uh, first uh, uh, utilised, I, I can vividly remember the first time that it was used in Warren. Um, I was confronted by a young boy who'd had a knife thrown at him and it embedded itself in, in his upper lip. Yeah. And so, and, and the normal procedure with that sort of uh, injury is to leave the foreign object in place and then transport them to a surgical facility where they, that can be managed. Yep. And the uh, overhead camera in the emergency department of Warren Hospital was switched on and the uh, surgeon who was on duty in Orange viewed the situation and gave instructions on how we were to manage that patient, transferring them to the Dubbo Hospital. I mean, it's, uh, so, you know, that, that instantly that surgeon had a very good idea of what was going on. You know, he could see that the patient's airway wasn't compromised. He could see that there was no hemorrhage. He, you know, he, um, I could have described all that to him over the phone, but he yeah. could, you know, a, pic, a picture visual, of the yeah. old story, the picture is worth... A thousand words, it. yeah. Yeah. Um, so what, I guess um, um, if I could uh, not put words in your mouth, but can I put a suggestion to you that um, 
the vCare system is, is a very good system. What we need to do is make sure that um, when, when we have uh, situations uh, like you experienced, Ms Cairns, where, uh, you know, it, it's about pastoral care as much as it is about um, medical care, that, you know, we need to be very, um, very cognisant of that um, if the system's being deployed. But for a situation like you've just pointed out, the, the, the deployment of that system can have a very positive um, patient outcome. We just need to be making sure that we look after and, and, and care for patients in, with that, that bedside manner and, and care that they, they deserve and, and, and expect. I have no doubt that it, it, it has a very important future, and I think, it, I think the system will evolve, but I think it, it should uh, evolve alongside face-to-face -to -face care. Yeah. It's a complement. It, complement. Can't, it can't yeah. be standalone. It, you know, it, well, it, if it is used standalone, it's cruel. It's yeah. cruel. Okay. No, no, and, and, and that, I think that's that, that insight that, you, you know, you've both been able to provide to us today, which is really important because we've heard really um, uh, positive stories around, the, you know, particularly telestroke as well is, mm. is one of those ones where, it, you know, we've got really fantastic um, patient outcomes. And, and I'm, I guess I'm cognizant that I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but we need to make sure that, that um, we provide, um, you know, the care that, that, that people deserve, you know, and... and you know, your, your father, you know, he was such a, a, a you know, wonderful man by all accounts and, and, and uh, you know, he, he, um, he deserved that. So, um, again, like I said, I'll, I'm, I'm passing on my uh, sympathies to you, but, um, you know, I, I, I thank you for coming again today to, to share your story. Yeah. Lou, did you have a question? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Karine, sir, first of all, sorry uh, for the loss of your, your father. One thing that sort of dist um, distressed me is we hear about he used to wake up in pain a lot. Can you go a little bit more about, about the pain management or how, uh, how was administered? Who was administering the pain management? Especially um, the end of life, that's um, something that's very close to me. Yes, um, the nurses, like obviously the virtual doctor would prescribe what medication he was to have over the 24 hour period. Um, unfortunately, the disease, I think, took us all, including him, by surprise at how quickly it progressed. Um, even his oncologist felt that he would still be with us at Easter. Okay. So he was shocked that he was in hospital and deteriorating. So I think it was just such an evolving progression that the medication that was prescribed at nine o'clock today by six o'clock tonight wasn't adequate to manage the pain that was just progressing so quickly. Um, and, by, and our hospital has lots of empty wards, very few nursing staff. I think we have 12 beds maybe um, allocated to the hospital. So we, we had minimal nursing staff they were worked off their feet because the majority of patients were palliative care. So we could press the buzzer to say that he needed medication, but they were already dealing with the three or four patients that needed them at that moment. So it could be two hours before I, he got his I, medication I understand delivered. anxiety and the stress you went through. Um... You know, it and it wasn't the nurse's fault. Please don't think that I'm blaming them. There was minimal staff there working with the patient type of patients they had. So that's why the syringe driver was so important to get for him, where they loaded it up and it automatically medicated him so that he wasn't two hours in pain before he got the medication to try and ease that pain down, which wouldn't happen immediately. Yeah. No, no, yeah. thank you very much. Look, it reminds me of what I experienced many years ago uh, when it's my mother's uh, death through cancer and how she would be screaming out for pain as well. This was like 25 years ago. Yes. But it just brought back memories, and I, I'm deeply sorry for what you went through. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you for attending this hearing and um, thank you for sharing your stories. 
Um, we will now uh, move to a lunch break and. I now welcome our next witnesses. Could I ask each witness, starting from my left, um, to please state their name and position title and swear either an oath or an affirmation. Thank you. Jessica Brown, General Manager of Strategy and Growth at Marathon Health. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thank you. Julie Cullen Ward. Uh, practice lead for disability and workforce development at Marathon Health. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thank you. Tanya Forster, Director and Psychologist, Macquarie Health Collective. I solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. My name is Bill Maiden. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of My Emergency Doctor. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. And I'm Dr Justin Bower. I'm the medical director and the founder of My Emergency Doctor and I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. We now have a little bit of time to have some short opening statements and considering there's quite a few of you, I do ask that you, if you do make one that you make them very short. Um, have, have you got an opening statement that you'd like to make? I do. Thank you. Thanks. Committee and Chair, thank you for inviting us to expand on our submission to your inquiry. Marathon Health is a regionally based not-for-profit organisation working in Western New South Wales, the Murrumbidgee and the South East. We are passionate advocates for equal access to quality health services for people wherever they choose to live. We responded to this inquiry to draw attention to the missing middle in healthcare in our communities, which has been created by the lack of allied health services. We also wanted to highlight some of the work that we've been doing to try and fill this gap so that people living out here can access services that keep them out of hospital and continuing to live independently. The critical shortage of community-based allied health professionals is well documented, with demand only increasing due to the NDIS and aged care reforms. They play a vital role in identifying issues early and linking people with other aspects of our health system. Without this link, we are seeing some worrying case studies emerge. Two in the last week from our staff are 40 preschool aged students in one rural community who have been identified with speech issues but have no access to services. So their families, carers, teachers and communities have just accepted that they will never speak properly. The residents in an aged care facility in a remote town who are at risk, a serious risk of choking that one of our speeches only noticed because they were there for something else. These gaps exist across all sectors, public, not-for-profit and private. Bulk build allied health services were once an option for all particularly lower income people, but they've all but disappeared from rural towns due, due to the demand for higher value work. The chronic, on a positive note, we know that when we have a skilled and experienced allied health workforce regularly visiting regional communities and linked in with other parts of the health system, we can create great health outcomes. Chronic disease management and prevention program provides monthly access to dietitians and diabetes educators out of medical practices across Western New South Wales. People needing the service wait less than a month. Plans are developed for people that link in with their GP and they are much less likely to be hospitalised. So to fill the gaps, we've been invested in growing our own workforce. Over the past three years, we have supported 48 speech, OT and social work students to complete clinical placements with us. It was enormous, an enormous effort from our staff, but it's resulted in 21 students choosing to work in regional New South Wales and 12 of those students gaining employment with Marathon Health. We don't just do this for our own benefit. We are committed to growing a regional allied health workforce to improve the health outcomes of people who live outside our cities. We know what works. Building relationships with universities, hosting students on clinical placements, demonstrating the benefits of working regionally, maintaining the connection with students through their studies results in them working and living out here. 
but it does come at a cost to our business. Our strategies in selling life as an allied health clinician in regional, rural and remote New South Wales are a genuine success story, but it's not something that we can sustain by ourselves. With the right investment and carefully thought out public-private partnerships, we can work together to grow an allied health workforce that ad adequately supports the missing middle, provides integrated care, supports the work of our GPs, creates better health outcomes and reduces the strain on hospitals. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms Cullen Ward, did you have an opening statement you wanted to make? Uh, no, that was uh, directed okay, opening thank you. statement. Uh, Ms Foster? Hi, my name is Tanya. I'm a psychologist and the director of Macquarie Health Collective and Macquarie Valley Family Practice. I'm a Central West local and a farmer's wife raising a family on the land. I hope this allows me to provide a unique insight today representing the local community, the private sector and both general practitioners and allied health providers surfacing our community. In preparing for, to for today, I anticipated that you've probably now heard from a number of people who've discussed the variety of challenges we face in regional New South Wales. While I think this is important to cover, I also hope today to discuss some of what we're attempting to do to move forward and provide practical solutions for our community. I established my practice with the goal of providing innovative and collaborative services for regional New South Wales. I face the same challenges that I'm sure you've now heard about across these hearings. Recruitment is challenging. Retaining staff is challenging. Servicing our broad distances is challenging. I do believe that there are things that can be done to help, however. We propose that innovative models of healthcare and collaborative partnerships across organisations may assist in providing a solution to some of the current barriers to healthcare in regional New South Wales. In preparing for today, I spoke to a number of providers. I find that so often at these events, unfortunately the people doing the work do not get the opportunity to speak as they're busy doing the work. I hope to do my best today to represent these individuals. We know that doctors do not want to relocate from metropolitan areas to remote communities where they have to practice as a solo GP with minimal support, no cover for leave, no employment for their partner and minimal services available in their community. I think it's time we rethink the way we approach this rather than re repeatedly trying the same thing and getting the same outcome. Flying in VMOs is costly and does not lead to a sustainable service for our regional communities. I think a potential solution comes back to collaboration and partnerships across organisations. We've been in discussions with the LHD about how we can co-recruit and allow opportunities across our organisations. We have an established medical and allied practice allowing doctors to join a team of colleagues with strong supports in a well-resourced community that can adequately provide for them and their family. We think this can be leveraged to help provide outreach services for regional communities mental health and palliative care. As a psychologist myself, obviously a key target of our organisation relates to mental health. I currently lead a team of four psychologists and clinical psychologists and continue to expand on this service. I hope we can continue to think creatively about how we support not only Dubbo, but regional New South Wales. Another key focus for our business is palliative care. We've partnered with Dubbo Area Nursing Service and the Death Literacy Institute in an attempt to provide collaborative community-based services. In the coming months, we hope to conduct a community forum to allow people the opportunity to contribute to the development of these services. Telehealth. While we have been providing telehealth services for some time, across the course of COVID-19, one thing we've learned to do is provide strong, high quality telehealth services across all of our disciplines. The benefit this has brought to regional New South Wales is profound and this service needs to remain. Prior to the provision of telehealth services, we had families driving four hours each way to access our providers. Can you imagine driving four hours to attend a 50-minute psychology appointment only to turn around and drive home again? Yes, we would love to have providers in all locations across New South Wales, but this is not a realistic reality. Telehealth allows us to complement face-to-face services to ensure a service is available that otherwise would not be. You would not believe the number of people I've spoken to on their header, tractor, or parked on a hill in their Land Cruiser ute. These are people that would not have accessed that treatment had telehealth not been available. We know the statistics around farmers and healthcare, particularly mental health care. How amazing that they're actually engaging with this service. How amazing that after the years of drought they've endured, 
we're allowing them to access services without the pressure of leaving the farm and the stock they need to feed. I believe as a representative of the private sector, we provide a unique position to be able to assist with regional healthcare in New South Wales, but are not often involved in these conversations. The private sector allows for agile, innovative and cost-effective services, and when used in conjunction with government and non-government services, I believe there is potential to begin to bridge the gap we've faced for so many years. The final point I want to raise today is I think we need to change the perception of rural healthcare. I hope this inquiry can strive to do this rather than reinforce some of the negative stereotypes. We need to change the culture in medicine that working rurally would be a career setback. We need to change this culture from medical school onwards. Working regionally needs to be seen as a career progression just as much as working in a major city hospital. We also need to change the stereotype of living regionally. We're more than just mice and a dust bowl. Dubbo is beautiful. Join me on my deck for lunch and take in the views. I can assure you, it's a spectacular sight. I thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. I think it's incomprehensible that it's 2021 and we still have not gotten healthcare for regional communities right. I hope we can start a conversation about how we can do better. Our communities deserve it. Thank you. Uh, Mr Maiden, do you have an opening statement? Uh, Dr Barrow will speak on my behalf. Great. Thank Dr Bauer. Thank you. My name is Justin Bauer and I'm a fellow of the Australasian College for Emergency Medicine. I'm the founder and medical director of My Emergency Doctrine and with me is Bill, our CEO. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today and to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I founded My Emergency Doctor with a mission to end the healthcare postcode lottery so that rural and regional Australians could have access to the same specialist emergency medical care that those of us, like me, who live in cities, take for granted. As a specialist emergency physician myself, I know the life-saving difference that my colleagues and I can make every day working alongside the younger doctors in our own emergency departments. And I understand that the committee has, uh, has discussed the various experiences to date of telemedicine for GP consultations and referred specialist consultations. I think it's fair to say that telemedicine in the emergency department can actually be the most complex and has been delivered in many different ways. Today I'd like to share with you how my colleagues and I practice it and the benefits to patients and their on-site clinicians. Emergency specialist doctors are fellows of the Australasian College for Emergency Medicine. We're experts in rapidly assessing diagnosing and treating the sickest of the sick, either in person or via telehealth. My telemedicine service and I, we employ only emergency specialist doctors, 24-7, 365 days a year. And we've provide, been providing that support since 2016, and we've conducted over 72,000 consultations since that time. We work in two ways. We help ambulance services such as New South Wales Ambulance provide secondary triage, managing patients at home when local community GPs are closed, and in so doing, we free up ambulances to look after the sickest patients. And across Victoria and New South Wales, we also support the on-site clinicians and carers who look after sick patients in rural hospitals and nursing homes. And every day, we work side by side with emergency doctors, nurses and carers via a secure video link. And it's as though we were standing next to them looking after the patient with them. And as a result of our work, we've helped save lives, improve patient care, and reduce the strain on ambulance services and emergency departments. Look, when I set up this service, even my own medical colleagues expressed their doubt that we could provide emergency care at all by phone and video. But after managing more than 70,000 cases, I no longer hear this. When rural emergency clinicians call, we answer. We've looked after children and adults in extremis with septic shock, life-threatening asthma, even cardiac arrest. And the reality is that emergency specialists do this to support the junior colleagues via telehealth every day. Even when I'm on duty in my own hospital in Sydney, I'm telephoned every day by GP and remote colleagues asking for urgent help and advice. While, of course, it is much better to have the actual physical doctor there the trouble is that the specialist emergency physician can't be everywhere. There simply aren't enough of us to be on duty all day, every day, in every hospital and multi-purpose service in Australia. And that's why we set up our service. 
When the on-site staff need our help most urgently, they call us, and we're there to help them give the best possible care they can give. The on-site staff have told us repeatedly that they really value our support and the education we provide. I should add that most of our work helping the clinicians and patients in country hospitals is after hours, between 6pm and 6am. And that helps take the burden off the local GPs so that they can get a good night's sleep. I'd also like to acknowledge the proactive stance taken by New South Wales Health over the years in this regard, as well as the rural clinicians themselves. One day I would hope that every patient in Australia will be able to receive care by an on-site specialist emergency physician. But until that time, my colleagues and I will continue to support our rural colleagues by telemedicine. So the reason Bill and I are here today is to let you know that the telemedicine, the way we do it, where the on-site staff get the opportunity to ask us for help when they need it, that works every day. Honourable Members, once again, Bill and I would like to thank you for your time and I hope that the information I provided can support the inquiry accordingly. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. We're going to now move to questions and we'll hear questions from the government, from the crossbench and from the opposition. Um, we'll start with the opposition and he has <coughs> nine minutes. Nine minutes. Nine minutes. Well, then I'll, I'll, I'll be right quickly to my point. Um, Marathon, Health and, Marathon Health and Macquarie Health Collective. So you both are for profits. We're not for profit. You're not for profit. Um, Ms. Tonya Foster, are you for profit? We're for profit. You're for, you're for profit. Ms., um, Ms. Foster, so what are you actually seeking? I've, I've read through your submission. So you're seeking an expansion of private-public partnerships. Yes, I think that there's definitely value in that. We've already been in discussions with other uh, private, non-government and government agencies. I think that there would be a lot of benefit to increase collaboration. Realistically, the problem is too big and no service can do it independently. Mm -hmm. That being said, uh, of course, then assistance in terms of funding for these partnerships would be important because otherwise it's me working hard and funding it out of my own pocket. Now, you're, you say that you, you're involved in a practice of four psychologists, right? Amongst other things, yes, correct. Okay. So, in fact, do you, does your practice have a Medicare rebate? Yes, that's right. So, uh, to access the psychologist specifically, most people will come via their GP and get a Medicare rebate on consultations. Okay. Uh, in addition to the psychologist, we have a, TV, a team of GPs, medical specialists and other allied health providers. Now, your practice, is it based in Dubbo? That's correct. And how many um, clients, without going, into, without going beyond that, the number, uh, how many clients would you have on your books? Uh, approximately four and a half, five thousand. Four and a half, five thousand. Oh, so it's quite a large practice. Yes, we have approximately twenty providers. Twenty providers, and um, do you provide virtual consultations? Correct. Oh, a combination uh, of oh. telehealth and face-to-face -face services. At the moment, that's at the discretion of the client. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, there are some things we need to see in person, so we will then encourage them to attend the clinic if need be. Uh, but otherwise, they can select whether they would like to access us face-to-face -face or telehealth, uh, which, as I mentioned, really helps people who live at a distance from our practice. Um, of the, I think you said the figure was 20,000. Of, um, of those, how many of your clients would be Aboriginal? I don't know the exact percentage. We have a very high population, uh, Indigenous population that access, accesses our psychology services in particular. We work in partnership with the Aboriginal Children's Therapy Team to provide a free uh, psychology service for Indigenous families who reside in the 2830 postcode, age zero to eight years, which is an amazing service. Uh, we work in conjunction with their allied health team uh, to provide services for these families that otherwise would not access service. They are complex, high needs families and the outcomes that we get are life changing. Um, the, this morning we heard evidence that there was difficulty amongst the Aboriginal community navigating the Medicare system and getting the rebate and that it actually dissuaded them from seeking services. Have you found that? Uh, so that program removes that barrier because they are able to just access uh, 
uh, free psychology through a different funding system. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that there is, however, less service available for adults. Um, so Indigenous adults in our community, unfortunately, don't have the same access that the children do. Awesome. The paediatric program is brilliant, but from my knowledge, it pretty well stops with paediatric. Now, in your submission, you make a, refer, a reference to palliative care services. So are you proposing that palliative care be provided by for-profits? I think we play a role. Play a role. I think in conjunction with other services. Sorry, you have to repeat that. I couldn't hear that. Sorry, I think in conjunction with other services, we certainly play a role. So the agencies that I mentioned today when I was speaking, they are also profit services, uh, but we have been trying to form a partnership together uh, because I can see significant gaps in the service availability at the moment. We have a visiting specialist who I believe comes once a month. We have two, nervous, two nurses who are servicing a huge area. They're overstretched and outside of hours, access to services is really poor. So how do you envisage the palliative care services taking place? So will they be face-to-face -face or will they be teleconference? Uh, I think majority of would be face-to-face. -face. Yeah. And the double area nursing service that I mentioned, they would provide the nursing services under this partnership. So they would take a key role in some of that face-to-face -face, uh, hmm. caring um, provision. And then we would assist by providing things like general practice and psychology services for these families. Dr. Uh, Dr. Bauer, yes. um, were you here earlier for the evidence from the daughter of the man who died at Narromine Hospital? No, I wasn't. Oh, you weren't? Okay. Are you familiar that there, there, there could be challenges um, diagnosing or dealing with patients who are, for example, 92-year-old men, uh, um, diagnosing or engaging with him via virtual medicine? There are issues diagnosing anyone. Um, we have come across, in my practice, in yeah. hospital and in telehealth, yeah. um, difficulty diagnosing. It's often more related to the seniority and expertise of the doctor concerned. Um, perhaps, I, I was not familiar with the case you're talking about, was the gentleman unable to communicate? For oh, no, he example? was able to communicate, but he was 92 years old. He had a blood cancer cancer disease. Uh, however, there was miscommunication on the link and from the doctor, doctor in Sydney. I guess I guess I want to take you to, um, can I jump forward then if you didn't see it? Uh, so your practice is called My, um, my Emergency Doctor. That's now is right. that a, is that a, you say your practice, is that a for-profit practice run by you? Yes, it is. So how does it navigate or intersect with the New South Wales health system? Uh, what we do, the New South Wales health system uh, commissions calls from us. And so, for example, if a patient calls New South Wales Ambulance 000, yep. um, they will be sometimes assessed if they're calling from a nursing home, for example, and they might get put through to us, the carer will get put through to us. Or if in rural, for instance, in the Murrumbidgee Critical Care Advisory Service, yep. the on-site nurses and doctors will call us for assistance okay, with so the patient. I can, so I can get my mind around this. So do doctors in points around the state in remote areas call a special number and they're patched through to one of your doctors? That's right. Oh, that's how it works? Yes. Okay. okay. So what training do your doctors receive? Well, as well as every one of our doctors being a specialist emergency physician, mm -hmm. um, we give them extra telehealth training of our own uh, because obviously it's not enough just to be a specialist. You have to be good at telehealth as well, as well as the limitations and constraints. So one has to be very careful to do the right thing and have an appropriate extra level of caution if you take my meaning. I know, I, I take your meaning because this is our fourth hearing and mm. we've had written submissions and we've had, ex not expert, but personal evidence from individuals, from surviving family members, that it's a matter of just simply putting a patient in front of a camera. I think this speaks to the different ways that people use telehealth. And I can't speak for the way that other providers do, yeah. but this is why we're very careful to say, look, there actually has to be 
in the rural hospital or emergency department or what have you, an on-site clinician standing there with the patient. Okay, so does yes. your service, will you put a call, or receive a call from a nurse? Yes, a nurse or a doctor. A nurse, okay, so what if a nurse is there by herself or his cell? You will still take that call? If they're asking for our help, of course. Right, and um, so do you get many calls a day? How many calls would come into your service a day? Uh, we'd get about 120 or so. And how long would each, would they last in duration? Well, it depends. Probably the shortest call might be about 15 minutes, but the longest call in recent memory was four hours. Four hours? Four hours, yes. It was a very sick, asthmatic child. And so our specialist emergency physician stayed on the line with the on-site staff until the retrieval doctors could come. 120 a day? Yes. 120 a day. And that is from all points of the state, most remote areas, Narromine, Warren, Gilgandra? Yes, it's, it's not only from all points of the state, it's also from uh, rural Victoria as well. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yes, we keep pretty busy and some of these calls are extremely long because some of the patients are very sick. One last question. What if something goes wrong? What if something goes wrong? What if something goes wrong on a call? Well, no, no. What's something, if something life-threatening, no, no, I want the, an answer to this. Very quickly. What if something life-threatening happens on the call? What do you do? I can probably answer that by saying we get called because there's something life-threatening and they what? need a but special uh, emergency. Mr. Seckard, Mr. Seckard, order, Mr. Seckard, order, order. order. Well, Mr. Seckard, order. No, order. Order. Walt, Mr. Seckard, Walt, 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 this is the stuff order. you keep doing. Order, order, Mr. Seckard, I have asked you to stop speaking, please. Mr. Seckard. Point of order, Walt. There's been a point of order. Everyone has been very civil today. You've always got to do one stunt a day, and this is the uh, one uh, you're pulling. I, I would ask you uh, not to do it. Can the honourable member please give the uh, their point of order question. to the chair, yes, not to the can member? Can answer it? To the point of order, Ms. M Madam Chair? Yes. It was a very serious question, and I think the community wants to know, what happens when a situation spirals out of control, well, he's, when he's, a poor he's, nurse is in a remote hospital by herself? It. That is my question. I'll end it there. Would you like to put that question on notice? No, I would like to have it answered today, but I'll bow right. to the chair's I'm, decision. I'm Thank happy you. to answer it. I, yeah, if you could very, give us a very short answer, that would be very appreciated. Thank of you. Of course. Well, typically we're called when it spirals out of control so that we can help the on-site staff. Um, because, of course, you know, many of them are not as experienced as we are in, in supporting those patients. So we've actually had people calling us because they're doing chest compressions on people in cardiac arrest. So we support those on-site staff to give the best possible care that they possibly can. Because when you think about it, if we weren't there, it would still be out of control as much as it would be if we were there. But when we're there, we can help and we can improve the care that those patients get, give them the best possible care that those clinicians can give and actually support the clinicians, the patients and their families through what is probably the worst day of their lives. Thank you, Dr. Bower. Um, I have a couple of questions uh, for Ms. Brown and uh, Ms. Cullenwood. Um, you note in your submission um, that many nurses and allied health students feel underprepared working in rural locations. Um, what do you think needs to be done to, to address this issue? Um, well, there's a number of things that can be done. Um, having um, relationships with um, universities to um, put in place pathways and education for um, rural students or people wanting to take a placement in a rural area. There are existing um, modules that people can do, online modules. Universities have developed um, some training. but And I can give you an example. Just one of our colleagues has just delivered um, a paper at for yeah, students at um, the University of Newcastle. Um, one of the questions she got wa was from people in the room, students, um, about what it would look like if they went to a rural area. What were the supports that they required? What, so wanting to know really at that level what it would look like and, what, and they were very interested in the types of supports that were available. So um, I think a structured process for that, a lot of universities do have rural placements. They have a requirement for their um, their courses that there is a rural placement. But in reality, it's quite difficult to get rural placements. 
Um, and so some students miss out on having a, a rural rural placement and they might go to somewhere you know, closer to their large city or their large regional centre. Because students have to leave their job, leave their home, um, it's expensive for them. Some students have two or three jobs. So there's a number of things that are required for a student to, to go rurally. So preparation for um, knowledge, um, financial remuneration, um, and education around what the placement and will, will look like for them. Accommodation. Does that? Yeah, definitely. No, thank you very much for that. Did you have something to add yeah, to that? Also, yeah. um, cultural safety training. So making sure that those um, students feel confident delivering services in a culturally safe way to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, that's something that we're doing and have received some funding to do just to make sure that they're confident and delivering safe services. Um, you, you also argue in your submission that there needs to be greater investment in preventing chronic diseases in the community. Um, what's happening currently in this space um, and, and, and what needs to happen? So um, an example, our Indigenous Chronic Disease Clinic in Bathurst that we run and have run for a, quite a number of years now, what we're seeing is multi-generational impact of diabetes on families. So grandma, mum, and now children coming into the service. Um, so it is just about that having the skilled and experienced allied health clinicians in communities who can pick those issues up early and work with doctors and work with other health professionals, um, community nurses and others in, the, others in the healthcare systems to spot those things early and put interventions in place to stop that multi-generational impact. Uh, we're running a research project um, in Wellington um, to identify some of the su success factors around stopping multi-generational diabetes impacts and um, we should have some more findings about what, the, what um, the successful interventions are out of that. Wonderful. Thank you both. Um, the Honourable, oh, sorry, Ms Kate Fairman. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. So, I just wanted to, just a few questions to Dr. Bower in relation to the uh, My Emergency Doctor. So are there other organisations like yours providing this service? Uh, yes, there are. So for instance, in Western Australia, they have an emergency telehealth service. Um, and there are also critical care advisory services throughout New South Wales um, that face some colleagues like myself assist with. Okay, so just trying to, to work out how it works in practice. Yeah. So for public hospitals, how do they know who to connect through to? How do they, who, who makes the choice in terms of whether it's a doctor at the end of, say, for my emergency doctor or another organisation that's providing the service? I think um, that's probably a question for the hospitals themselves, but basically as far as the clinician is concerned, they press the button or, or make the telephone call and they're put through to a specialist emergency physician. And it's clinician to clinician, it's regardless of who the organisation is. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question quite uh, yeah, what you're I asking. The question is then coming to, to funding and, and, and basically how it's set up. And I can oh. definitely ask the, um, the um, government uh, reps who are coming after you, but how is, from your perspective, what's the funding model then for my emergency doctor well, the clinicians? Fun yeah, well, the funding model is that um, it's obviously free to the patient and family, yes. of course, um, but the hospitals themselves or New South Wales Ambulance, for instance, uh, have the contractual arrangement with us. Right, so my emergency doctor would receive some kind of payment from the clinicians, therefore uh, I'm assuming it's a for-profit, the, the service you've set up is a for-profit service, so there's some, yeah. Yes, yeah, so I have to pay my doctors. Yeah, yeah. okay. I'm happy to take questions. So... Your submission also makes a point about the COVID-19 pandemic, that it's an accepted part of life to receive healthcare in a face-to-face -face setting. Was my emergency doctor specifically set up as a result of COVID-19? No, we weren't. Um, I first had the idea several years ago and started it in 2016. 
Okay, and do you have you? What's the growth that you have experienced over the last, say, two years since you set up then? Well, it's certainly been quite profound. I think um, the exigencies of COVID have meant that a lot of people have understood what we can do with telehealth and telemedicine to support regional and rural communities. So there's been quite a lot of um, growth since then. Okay. With, I just wanted to ask Mrs Forster, I think, which is the Macquarie Health, that's correct? Yes. Yes. You state in your submission that you've had discussions with the Honourable Mark Coulton MP, Minister for Regional Health, in relation Great to Minister. in relation to the potential public-private partnerships you're, you're advocating for today. What specifically, what specifically, when you say if government funding was available to support these models, we feel our potential to support the community would be greatly increased, what specifically does that look like for you when you're talking about government support being about, made available? I think that what we're trying to do from a private practice in Dubbo is provide clinical support to a huge area of our state and to, um, a, you know, a, I guess a, a big percentage of people in New South Wales. I think that there are costs that are associated with that and we do our best to be able to minimise that for families. Uh, but then because we are a private practice, then uh, the cost does then come to the family. Uh, I think that if we are going to really look at collaboration across agencies, there needs to be some consideration taken of the costs that are involved in that. I think historically, a lot of funding opportunities probably don't really go into the private sector. They generally do fall with other agencies, which is completely fine. But I think the other agencies also aren't able to fully meet the need. And so if we were able to look at partnerships across agencies, then I feel like we have a stronger workforce to be able to bridge the gap and meet the need across the state, not just in Dubbo. Thank you. Uh, the Honourable Wes Fang. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for all uh, coming and appearing before us today. Um, I really thank you for taking the time and, and sharing all your experiences. Uh, Mrs Forster, um, your opening statement was, was profound and, and fantastic because I, there were two things that I really um, I thought were notable in your opening statement. The first one was the distinction you made around telehealth and you know it, it's a word we've heard bandied around uh, in these inquiries but you made quite an important distinction that you know there is differences in telehealth. There's a telehealth that a patient will receive um, from uh, a clinician in, in, a, in a room and they might be like you said on a ute uh, on top of a hill um, and it, it's providing that access to health care and say psychology services or, or specialist services that they, they wouldn't have got um, as opposed to I guess the uh, the V care system or the you know rural generalist care system that you know is in the hospital so thank you for, for broaching that and um, one other thing you you broached about was the negative stereotypes and I'm from Wagga so you know I love rural and regional communities and, and I could tell when you spoke about you know Dubbo, that you do as well. Um, how do you find that when people come here that they they have a, you know, perhaps a negative stereotype in their head, um, but it's actually corrected when they come here? And the other thing we've heard recently is that um, this inquiry itself has generated quite a lot of um, uh, negativity around um, health services in rural and regional settings, and that's actually creating an issue of attracting um, people to those settings. Can you provide some thoughts on that? That was a big question, but I'll do my best. <laughs> so, yes, I do think that people have a negative stereotype of living regionally, and I think it's inaccurate. <coughs> I think when people are able to come here and experience what it's like to actually live in Dubbo or surrounds, their mind can significantly change. We have people who have relocated, joined our practice, and are now here 20 years down the track. Rural life is great. It's not what it's often portrayed to be. And I think once they experience the community, then they finally get to see that. Like I said, we're not just mice in a dust bowl. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, the second part of your question, sorry, was? Just around the negativity. Like, we, we've, we've seen a lot of negativity around rural regional health uh, care. And yes. that it makes it, one, hard to attract people, but two, 
Um, we've had reports of um, some of the <coughs> frontline staff being attacked um, because of, um, say, some of the political attacks that are coming out of this inquiry. Can you elucidate on that? Just evidence. You heard it today, Walt, so just sit there and listen. Oh, Sorry, order, order. It's order. evidence. Ms Foster? Uh, Ignore them. Attacks. Ignore them. <laughs> So, yes, unfortunately, I think there's a negative message that comes out, and that's why I raised the point earlier, because I really hope that isn't the summary of what comes out of these hearings. Yeah. We don't want to make people who live in the city, especially doctors who are living in metropolitan areas, believe that rural health care is in a major crisis and is a major problem, because why would you want to move to that? Why would you want to take on that challenge? Yeah. Uh, I think that we need to be able to show some of the good news stories. We need to be able to show some of the things that are going well. And that's why I didn't want to focus my talk today on the problems in healthcare. Yeah, they're there. We all know it. You don't need me to harp on about it. You've heard it for four days. Uh, there's a lot of great things going on. We see it at this table today. Yep. And I think we need to show people that. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Mr. Maiden, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Barra, um, thank you uh, very much for appearing today. Um, uh, I've been a, an advocate for um, telehealth or vCare or uh, whatever name we put around it, but um, I guess from my lived experience, having been you know, in retrieval medicine, I've seen it firsthand, um, but also uh, I guess you've seen way more than I would have. Um, you've seen the political attacks that have come out of it and, and the way that people have been trying to politicise it. Can you possibly provide some um, insight into what good things can come out of um, having that support from, from, from uh, vCare or telehealth medicine? Thanks very much. Look, I think that cuts to the heart of it that says, look, telemedicine practised correctly should never displace and it should never replace. It should only ever augment and support. support. So realistically, the best way of telemedicine is to say there are on-site clinicians, doctors, nurses, and what have you, allied health. And the specialist comes in and helps them and supports them. And it's the same specialist as you alluded to that said they're four hours away. Mm. And so you get, it would be lovely, as I said, to have the specialist there, but this is the next best thing. And it's basically allowing that patient to get the best possible care they can get at that time it's allowing their family to get that support and it's allowing the on-site staff. And to speak to getting people out here to the communities and getting health professionals out here to the communities, you know, because I know you would have heard this, that there's a lot of healthcare professionals who come out and might feel isolated, but this helps end that because you've got your mate there and you've got your support there and they're able to help you. So it's not just allowing the best possible patient care, but it's actually also talking about retention and supporting the on-site people who are giving the care every day. Yep. Now, you would have heard throughout the inquiry that there, there has been uh, limitations, instances where um, telehealth hasn't, um, vCare hasn't been, um, I guess, uh, the best way of um, providing support or, or treatment to a number of people, and, and that's certainly been, um, I guess, uh, uh, ventilated, but we're not getting, you know, and, and we, we acknowledge those stories, right? But, but uh, do you know of any, like, good stories where without the intervention of um, the virtual care, we would have had uh, very negative outcomes? Every day. Um... Look, I'll give you a, an illustrative example. It's about a month or two ago, and one of our colleagues, one, one of my colleagues was called as part of our service, and the on-site clinician was, look, I've got a guy and he's got reflux and a bit of heartburn and he's fine. So look, can I see the ECG? And the on-site clinician said, look, that's fine. And we looked at the ECG and the guy was having a heart attack. So, and the on-site clinician was a great clinician, but junior and perhaps just a little less experienced. Um, and that's the point about getting the specialist right there immediately available to support them. And we saved that guy's life with the on-site clinicians. And that's the sort of story that we're seeing every day. And so that, that story is, is not unique or it is unique? Or... It's not unique. And 
I guess in that instance, it's not publicised, is it? Like we're not, we're not talking about those positive stories about how the intervention of uh, uh, special, you know, emergency specialist providing that support. Uh, it's not getting out there, and so we're only getting sort of a slanted view of the the, the, the telehealth system. I think that's true. I, I think there is a, a belief, and it's very understandable that the tele-emergency that when people are talking about it in rural and regional communities is talking to a doctor through an app instead of an on-site doctor. And it's not about that. It's the on-site doctor is there and the patient's there and their family is there and they're all there and the specialist is beamed in and they're by their side and they're making it better yeah. and they're, they're improving patient care. And it's not just emergency medicine, is it? I mean, we're That's talking right. about specialties across the board that you wouldn't necessarily have in a rural and regional setting. So uh, obviously you provide emergency medicine, but you, you could be talking about um, neurosurgery or... or um, uh, uh, That's very uh, true. Yeah, yeah, across, cardiology support. Yeah. You wouldn't actually necessarily have those people in a, in a base hospital or, you know, or a secondary type hospital. I think that's the point, isn't it? But, you know, it, every specialty is now doing telemedical support of rural and regional Australia. Every one of my colleagues is doing it. Yeah. Cardiologists, vascular surgeons, renal physicians, and it's been a game changer. It's yeah. a game changer for rural and regional Australians. And these are, these are services that were never provided to uh, even even like large, dis, like large regional cities, even. That's right. Yeah. And, and if they were, they had to travel four hours to get there and four hours back. Thank you. Um, sorry. I'm just going to very quickly. quickly. You've in got your 10 seconds. submission, you referred to a, a, um, a report that's been prepared, I think, by the uh, Department of Victoria in relation to um, their urgency care, and you said it's going to be released some stage this year. Do you know when that is, will be released, or if you could give a copy of that to the committee to be looked at as well? I'll be very happy to. Thank you. Sure. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, all of you, for coming today and attending this hearing. Um, we will now move on to our, our next witnesses. Now welcome our next witnesses. Um, and I'll be asking each witness to state their name, position title, and swear either an oath or affirmation. Um, but I recognise that uh, Mr. Scott McLaughlin and uh, Dr. Shannon Knott do not need to give an oath or affirmation today because they have already previously given one. Um, so I'll start with Mr. Fay. Good afternoon. My name is Adrian Fay. I'm the Executive Director of Quality clinical safety and nursing for Western New South Wales Local Health District, I'd like to take an oath. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr Strickland. Yeah. My name is Robert Strickland. I'm the acting CEO for Western New South Wales Primary Health Network. I'll take the oath. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thank you. Dr. Robin, uh, Dr. Williams, sorry. I'll go for Robin, sorry. Yeah. Uh, yes, I'll take the oath. Uh, I'm uh, uh, the chair of the Western New South Wales Primary Health Network, uh, and I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thank you. Ms Berryman. Hi, I'm Sonia Berryman. I'm the General Manager of Primary Health Care and Integration for the Western New South Wales Primary Health Network and I'm doing the affirmation. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. We now have an opportunity to give a short opening statement. Uh, uh, Mr Fay, do you have a statement you wish to make? I'll uh, defer to Mr McLaughlin if that's okay. Certainly. Thank you, Madam Acting Chair. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge that we are meeting today on the Tabagar country of the Wiradjuri Nation and offer my respects to the Elders, both past, present and those emerging in the future. I'd also like to offer my um, respect to the 30,000 Aboriginal people right across Western New South Wales and the nine Aboriginal nations. At the recent hearing of this inquiry in Cobar, um, the, the Chair um, emphasised the grave concerns that were being expressed in this forum and the good faith of those people who are appearing as witnesses. I can assure the committee and all of our communities that we absolutely want to hear experiences. We respect the courage that it takes to come to this type of proceeding and tell personal and distressing stories. To those who have experienced the, the care that is 
not what they needed or wished. I want to say again how sorry I am. We have a strong culture of accountability in our district. And while the majority of people who come to our services leave with an outcome and an experience they do value, when it doesn't occur, then we are committed to learning from it. Part of that learning is growing our understanding of Aboriginal culture. In our footprint, over 13% of the population are Aboriginal and have a strong cultural connection, bringing a beautiful strength and diversity. But this comes with a deeply distressing history and a need to engage and provide health services differently. We know that there's a long way to go, but we have a genuine commitment to creating respectful, culturally inviting and safe services for Aboriginal people to access care. This is a path we're walking alongside partners, including our Aboriginal medical services, both the Murdy Parkey and Three Rivers Assemblies, our Aboriginal health workers, patients and communities. And we're absolutely open to engaging and hearing how we need to change. I do want to make a couple of comments uh, in relation to testimony provided yesterday that may be of concern to people and our communities. To be clear, there are no restrictions placed on the medication or consumable stock that are kept in a hospital. Obviously, not every hospital is able to keep stock of every available medication. However, if a patient is unable to be treated because the precise medication they required cannot be sourced, it would constitute an event that would and should be reported. We've not been able to locate any such um, reports in our small rural hospitals over the last 12 months. All of our hospitals do keep a stock of routinely uh, used antibiotics. It's a different medication is required. It can be ordered through our pharmacy services and delivered by our courier services. Standard insulin types are kept, are kept in our hospitals. However, patients often require highly specified and specific insulin medications. In those cases, it may be the case that a patient is asked to bring their medication with them if they come to hospital until their specific prescription can be ordered by the hospital. We also do not place any restriction on the stock of consumables such as continence pads, wound dressings and suture kits. Our hospitals routinely keep sufficient amounts of stock to cater for the usual volume of work. If stock does run low or it's exhausted, then it should be reported and addressed by the local manager. Madam Acting Chair, the realities of our medical workforce challenges deserve our determination and focus. At the heart of these problems is the ongoing supply of local GPs who are available to work in our hospitals. Rural generalist doctors, known as gen GPs, are a crucial part of our primary care services, as you'll hear from Dr Williams here today. Um, their care helps us stay well. It can help us avoid illness and help us avoid needing care in a hospital. As well as working in their private practice, doctors sometimes also work in their local hospital as visiting medical officers or VMOs. Um, they'll work in the emergency department, admit patients to hospital beds. Now, this is work that requires a particular skill set. Even when there are GPs available locally, not all doctors want to or can work at the hospital. For the ones that do, um, it's challenging to find a balance between working on call, running a business and their personal life. Um, when we can't find a local GP who wants to be a VMO, finding fly-in doctors willing to commit to ongoing support for a community can be really difficult to source, um, order, even Chair. with extraordinary payment times. Sorry, sorry, can I just stop you for a moment? There's been a can I just order? check that how much of this is a repeat of what the committee heard two weeks ago, and fair enough in terms of addressing the issues we heard yesterday, but we have limited time, and I feel like I have heard this statement in some ways before, so could you please not include the paragraphs we've already heard, which were of a generic nature last time, and just, could I suggest he shorten his statement, because I feel Certainly like we're I'll running out of time. Very soon. quick. Okay, sure. Uh, in that case, I will leave it up to the witness whether he wants to continue Very or shorten. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks. I'm mindful of the comments made by the Chair of this committee at the Cobar hearing that no one should pretend that everything in rural health is wonderful. We certainly don't. And the challenges that we face now aren't new and they aren't ignored for a second. The reality for our communities is not lost on us, Madam Chair. Um, their health needs are critical in our everyday consideration of we want 
of what we want and what we can provide. I give our commitment to listen, understand and you continue to improve. Thank you. Dr Knott, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? That's fine. I'm happy for my colleagues. Thank you. Uh, Mr Strickland, did you have a comment? Dr Williams will talk. Dr Williams, thank you. Um, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we are meeting on and remind people that we live and work in our uh, Sorry, land. Dr Williams, to interrupt. Could I get you to speak into the other mic as well? You'll need to speak in both. One's for Hansard and one's for amplification. <laughs> thank you. Fair enough. Okay. So, um, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we are meeting on and remind people that we live and work on Aboriginal land. And I also acknowledge the Aboriginal, Aboriginal elders of this community, those who have passed and all Aboriginal people attending this meeting today. So my name is Robin Williams and I'm chair of the Western New South Wales Primary Health Network. More importantly uh, to me, I am a coalface GP and VMO having practised as a rural GP in Wales for 10 years before emigrating to New South Wales and have been a GP in Gulgong for 10 years previously and Molong and Yeovil for the last 14 years. This will be my 40th year as a doctor. Our small towns in this region are in crisis. The PHN has identified that there are 43 small communities which are at risk of losing GP services in the next five to 10 years as older GPs retire, or burn out and leave, or die, and are not replaced by the new generation of doctors. Remedial action is required now. There is a fantastic resource of committed people in our health services who care deeply about our communities, who are here to help with reforming health delivery, reforms which need to be radical. In my 24 years in the Central West, I've been honoured to serve in a number of organisations as Chair of the Dubbo Plains Division of General Practice, as Chair of the New South Wales RDN, and as Chair of the Western New South Wales Local Health District, as well as numerous appointments to advisory committees, always advocating for rural communities. Many of those appointments have been ministerial appointments, and I come from ministers on both sides of the political spectrum. And I've been happy to give advice from the coalface to anyone who sought it in order to try and move the reform agenda forward. I'm happy to have constructive dialogue with anyone, but I fear that health becomes a political football which is kicked around to create sound bites for the media, especially at election times. I'll put in a historical context here, we cannot afford to fiddle while Rome burns. <coughs> Health is too important to get caught up in the quagmire of state versus federal politics, and the only people who can lead us to find real solutions are you, our elected representatives. Rural health needs a unified approach involving federal, state, and local government to come together to get away from the perennial blame game. I've met many fine politicians on both sides of the political divide, in both the federal and state spheres. But while I am here to answer your questions, I first would like to pose a question to all of you. And this is where my second and final historical quote is apt. 60 years ago, John Fitzgerald Kennedy was inaugurated as US president. His inaugural address contained this statement which I will ask of you and of all politicians who have the means to facilitate the provisions of equity, of access and world-class health services to this a first world country, if only you have the resolve. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we'll now go to questions, um, and I will, we will get questions from the government, from the crossbench and the opposition. Um, we will be starting with 15 minutes uh, for the Honourable Walt Seckord. Thank you. Uh, Mr McLaughlin, um, you heard my questions earlier to Dr Justin Bauer. What steps do you take when there's an adverse outcome or a death that occurs during a virtual doctor incident? Uh, Mr. Cord, we take um, every adverse outcome or, or death very seriously. 
Um, we've got a lot of process and systems in place to review what happened, come up with um, solutions and recommendations for the future. Um, Mr Fay is the, the head of a, um, a team of specialist clinicians that um, come in to investigate um, those incidents. Oh, I'll hand over to him to talk about Mr. the... Mr Fay, are Mr. there many adverse, I'm using a medical phrase, adverse outcomes? Yes. Mr Secord, um, in the last year, yep. for 2020, there were 11 of those types of adverse events that you would yep. reference there today. Um, so, so 11 that occurred with virtual doctors in your local health district? No, sir. Um, 11 totally across the local health district. Yep. If you look at um, the presence or absence of a medical officer for those events, there were four of those events when there wasn't a medical officer present. So four events, four, are these called SAC ones? Harm score ones, Mr Sickold. Sorry, give them, give that to me again? Harm score ones so is, that is the terminology. So that is the top escalation, that is the top. Correct. So that's, there were 11 in the local health district, four involved, no doctor present. That's correct in the Thank last you. year. Continue, please, sir. Thank you. So there's a mandated process that's legislated um, that those yep. events are undertaken in a root cause analysis yep. investigation. Yep. That's a high level investigation um, with internal and external people who come in and review each of those harm score one events okay. and provide advice on what happened and what are the system recommendations. Are there any personal okay. Wonderful. professional Thank you. issues? Now, when an incident occurs when a nurse is by herself in a hospital, is there a doctor watching the sequence occurring? Is there a, is there a doctor somewhere or is it just the doctor in Sydney and the nurse in the hospital by herself or himself? Can you just please clarify that for me, Mr. Seckold? Um, you talking about virtual medicine, virtual doctors. Yes. So, example, Binda Kobar, nurse by herself, calls to Sydney for help. Are they the only two people on the, on the sequence? So there's the nurse on the sequence with the headset on talking yep. to the doctor and there's the other clinical staff um, who may be present in the facility, nursing staff, it could be paramedic staff supporting a resuscitation. Okay, but that's the example. case when there's no doctor there. That's what I'm referring to. Yes. Right. So you, we've had four incidents in the local health district where four people have died because of that. So what happens when a situation spirals out of control? When you have a situation where a patient is clearly dying or something's happening and they cannot be diagnosed, what happens? We have um, a number of our nurses who are trained in advanced life support in a course called First Line Emergency Care. There's approximately 230 of those nurses trained mm -hmm. in Western New South Wales and about 70% of those um, actually live and work out in our rural settings. They're the types of nurses who are able to provide an airway, put in an IV line and treat with advanced support drugs. Thank you. Now, of those four deaths that occurred where it was virtual doctor in, virtual doctor in Sydney, nurse here. Of those four, how many have been referred to the coroner? Um, all, of, all of those deaths, Mr Seckold, are, all four have been reported to are the coroner. originally referred to every um, sudden unexpected death that we have, um, that we aren't able to immediately write a cause of death or a death certificate for, are initially referred to the, the coroner, sudden unexpected deaths. So, and then so you've had, in your health district in the last year, We've had four deaths that have occurred with virtual doctors that have warranted being referred to the coroner. Yes. Thank you, sir. I'll move on to other questions. Um, of those four, four hospitals, can you tell me the names of those four hospitals? I'd need to take that on notice. I you, don't have the information immediately you take in front that on of notice me. and provide it to us, right. And um, how much, Mr. McFarlane, how much does the local health district spend on virtual doctors? In the 2021, Budget. How much do you spend on that? Mr. Secord, uh, we spend over $150 million on doctors in total. I'm asking a specific question the, and I only have 15 minutes, sir. Sure. Um, in uh, our virtual services, about $4 million um, of a team of the virtual rural general services that um, support all of our 33 um, small rural health services. On top of that, there's additional emergency specialists. Um, intensive care specialists and a range of other $4 specialists million that contribute thing. to that. Now, can I take you to the evidence? So, are the four hospitals in Warren Bungle Shire, the four hospitals, will you guarantee today that they have, that they have antibiotics, 
They have incontinence pads and dressing, a guarantee that all four hospitals have everything there. They all do have supplies. If they need additional supplies, then we can get those to them quickly. Will you guarantee that there is insulin at Coendra? Sorry? Coundra. C O. It's my accent. It's my yes. accent. I'll can spell it if you want. I think you know which can hospital. Andrew, thank you. I, excuse my accent. I've lived here for 33 years, but I still have it. Mm -hmm. So I think you know the medical service I'm referring to. Does it have insulin? I understand it does. Now, Parks Hospital. Is it, in fact, three days a week, the operating theatre shut? Uh, we've increased surgery just recently. Uh, we oh. are putting extra surgery into Parks Hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's more than two days a week. Um, it's sporadic on, on different days of the week uh, to help us um, uh, perform operations on, on more people. Now, double hospital, double hospital. Do you have dietitians on duty on the weekend able to conduct SIP tests? Are you familiar with SIP tests? I am. Do you know what a SIP test is? I do. Can you tell me Thank what you. a SIP test is? A SIP test is the ability for a patient to, uh, to swallow um, solid foods. Um, it's performed in, uh, in situations where patients have either been is intubated it, or, or is it for a other complex, reasons. Is it a complex taste, a test to undertake? Uh, I'm not a trained clinician in oh, that Dr. area. Oh, Dr. Shannon, uh, Dr. Shannon Knott. Is a SIP test controversial complex to undertake? No, it's not. Uh, and it's actually not the, the remit of dietitians to do SIP tests. That, that would usually be the remit of a speech pathologist or an appropriately trained nurse. Can a doc, oh, I was going to say, can a nurse, can a doctor, can most people in a hospital conduct a SIP test? If they're appropriately trained, yes. But you said it wasn't a complex procedure to undertake? No, it is not. Does your hospital at Dubbo now have a person who can do SIP tests on the weekend? Yes, I believe so. You know why I'm asking questions about this? This yep. relates to the tragic death of Mr. Alan Wells. Yes, I do. Are you, are you now confident that there are people on duty that can conduct SIP tests at your hospital? Yes, I am. Now, are you also comfortable with the allegation that, he tried, that when he tried to remove tubes from his arm when he was in absolute distress, that he was tied to the bed. I'm not familiar with the, the, the case that you're mentioning. Uh, my role... But it was on national television. It was on 60... Um, sorry, no, no. sorry. That, I, will that, no, to be, a, oh. I will continue to be respectful, but I want... This is an sorry, important uh, line Mr. of question. Mr. there has been a point of order. And I ask, I ask the member to... to... I, I don't want to um, interrupt, but I think it's important that uh, yeah, all the witnesses be provided yeah. the ability to finish their answer before okay. the Honourable Lord uh, Sickle jumps I, in again. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I hear Wes. I hear okay. Wes. Yes, thank you, Mr. So, Sickle. I'm, I'm referring to the 60 Minutes report, explosive report, that we all saw, and I'm referring to the treatment of Mr. Alan Wells. So I want to know, was any follow-up or investigations taken after that? Yes, there was, and I'll refer that to uh, Director of Clinical Governments. So, Mr. Seckol, there was an investigation into the death of Mr. Alan Wells yep. uh, that occurred. Um, it was a detailed investigation. It was submitted to the Ministry. Mm -hmm. uh, there were some findings, recommendations and outcomes um, that have subsequently been implemented as a result of that investigation. And what were the steps that were taken? What were the results of his, of his death? So the steps were taken, there were some obvious steps around better communication with the family. Um, that was an obvious one. There were, needs to be better communication, certainly between the orthopaedic surgeons um, and, the, and the family, particularly when there was a clinical deterioration of, of the patient. There are a number of recommendations. I don't have the report in front of me, four or five of, re of those recommendations, which um, I understand have been fully implemented at Dubbo Health Service as a result of that investigation. Mr. McLaughlin, how many people, how many nurses were on duty at Cobar Hospital this weekend? This weekend yep. would have uh, three nurses. Three nurses. Three nurses. Um, three nurses. What do you say to, um, I actually I have a different line of questioning. Earlier this morning, we, were heard, we heard about a phenomenon called exit block. In Sydney, we have something called trolley block, or we have um, ambulance block, ambulance block, where you have ambulances queued up outside of hospitals. 
But we have a different situation in country hospitals where we have what's called exit block. Uh, this was from I can ask questions based on information provided with a... I will continue. Do you, are you familiar with exit block? It's where there's not enough beds yes. in... in Mr. McLaughlin indicated, Mr. McLaughlin indicated that he's familiar with the concept. Mr. McLaughlin, you, does exit block occur here? Mr. Scott, we've got over 800 acute beds across the local health district um, on a daily basis. All of our services prioritise the patients that are coming through our emergency departments, need admitting to hospitals and those that can, come, can go home, um, or referred to, uh, to other services. Uh, on a daily basis, that's decisions made by our clinicians, our um, service managers, and making sure that patients get to the, the right place of care. Um, in some instances, uh, we don't have the ability to um, discharge um, as quickly as we'd like. And what we have done is resourced a lot of um, support services out of hospital. Um, they're being significantly enhanced at the moment, and particularly um, seeing the increased number of patients uh, that uh, come through in winter times typically. So, we do recognise there's an issue. We continue to resource additional services to support that. Um, I just ask the Honourable Walt Seckord uh, to move on to a different line of question, oh. given the sensitivity of the topic okay, of conversation. Fair Thank you. Um, sorry, can we revisit? So, you said this morning that there were three nurses on duty at Cobar Hospital on the weekend, three. So I count right now, there are one, two, three, four, five. Five New South Wales health bureaucrats here. There are more bureaucrats in this room at this moment than there were at Cobar Hospital on the weekend. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna raise I think a that's a very good point I'm, I'm to I'm gonna make. raise a point of order there. Go ahead. Um, Sorry, there's been a point of order. Well, you know, I, I, yet again, um, the Honourable Watch Secord has 15 minutes to ask questions to get answers out of this. It's not a chance to make a political statement. This was showing context. Uh, now, I think I, I, he's eating into my time, Ms. Ms. Chair. And you know, Walt, that you're supposed to be asking questions uh, no, no, of these excuse witnesses. Excuse me. Could you please direct any, any part of a point Apologies, of order? Chair. Chair. Apologies, Chair. Um, the Honourable Watts called well knows that the format for this is agreed to ask a question and elicit a response from the witnesses, and I'd ask him to do my so. Question, uh, to the point of order, my question goes to priorities. One, two, three, four, five. Five senior, senior bureaucrats. Here, brought to this I, inquiry I to monitor our proceedings all day, what if, and then on the weekend, what only three question? nurses in a hospital. I think this government has the wrong priorities. Is that, is that the best you can do as a stunt one? Sorry, Seriously? Natasha has... I was just going to say that um, this is uh, the opposition's time. He might want to stick to asking questions rather than uh, referring to members of the audience, which he knows uh, he shouldn't be reflecting on members of the audience who are here. Look, uh, look we've got just over a minute left for the Honourable Walt Seckord. So, uh, I mean, he has been very respectful and I appreciate that. So, um, I'll leave my questions at that. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question uh, for uh, Dr. Williams. Um, I note in the submission um, from your group that there was um, concern around patients in the area having difficulty to access GPs in their practice, um, so they go to the emergency department. Um, and obviously that must put a huge amount of pressure on the emergency department. Um, how does that affect um, the staff and their ability to, t to attend to everyone that actually presents at the emergency department? Yeah, I think that's a, a very uh, important issue. Certainly where I work in Molong, um, it puts a huge pressure. If, if we get too uh, full in our rooms, the default position is the, uh, the MPS, uh, and then the on-call VMO will be called, which is me. Mm -hmm. So I go from my rooms up to the, v to the hospital to see patients there if there is nowhere else to physically see them. Uh, or, so we try and encourage people to be seen in the rooms whenever we can. Um, and it is, again, it's, it comes back to workforce. The workforce issue is, is the problem. And a huge problem that we have is not, um, I, think the, I think the real problem is, is we had to reboot the, the whole rural of rural health, certainly in the small towns, <laughs> to encourage um, younger doctors to come out, which means the funding model has to change. We have to move away from purely fee-for-service to a blended model, and we need to have Commonwealth and state governments designing that with, with local input. That's the answer for the future, so then we can, we can uh, move forward. Um, 
I've got a very good relationship with my local MPS, the, the, the management there are, are very supportive. Uh, telehealth has supported me to stay in that, uh, in that town because as the sole VMO for the last uh, three years, apart from uh, when my uh, colleague, Dr. Zambo, covers me for, for uh, holidays, I'm, I'm it. So for four days a week, I, I do a 24-hour cover for my inpatients and I, and I cover the ED during the daytime. And on the other three days of the week, I go in and do a ward round, sort out whatever's in the, in, in the uh, ED department, and then I'm, I'm off. So that keeps me um, up to, from avoiding you know, being burnt out. Mm. If I didn't have V-care, uh, I would have had to leave long ago. And if I had left, then my two registrars would have left with me. There would be no training opportunities for any young doctors. And Molong and Yeovil and the surrounding towns would not have had any services, GP services whatsoever. So we need very quickly to try and develop a new model of funding uh, and of, uh, of, again, I can't reiterate this too strongly, of federal and state to work together to try and develop a new, a new model of care. It's, it's, it's vitally important. And, and I must say, um, I've had uh, a very receptive um, 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 hearing from uh, Minister Mark Halton from the federal level. And I must say that of all the, the uh, state um, ministers that I've worked with um, across, across the political divide, there's two, two standouts for me. One was, was Craig Knowles, and the, the, the one that st stands out more than any of them, and there's been a lot of them since 1997 when I emigrated, is, uh, is uh, Gillian Skinner. She was really committed to rural health. So this isn't a party political issue, and that's why I'm a little bit frustrated that it's going to degenerate into a shouting match between uh, people from the, across the divide, of the political divide. This is about rural health and our communities. And we need, uh, we need politicians of all um, uh, colours and, and, and from across the spectrum to work constructively to work out what's best for our communities. because. As I said, if we keep on talking and having more reports and a new, uh, a new uh, investigation, all we're doing is spiralling into a worse and worse situation where people of my generation, I'm now 63, I'm not going to go on forever, and there will, no be, there will not be people to replace me in the future if we don't change the model to make it more attractive for younger doctors. So we've got to do that. And then on from that, we have to make sure that it's more attractive for allied health and nurses, because they're vitally important. I couldn't work my do my practice work without my nurse support. So we've got to, we've got to re rethink what we're doing, and that's what I'm here for, to ask you, as our leaders, our elected representatives, to work with your colleagues as a matter of urgency to do something to support small towns in the Central West and beyond. Because the further out you go beyond, the worse the morbidity is, the worse the mortality is, and this is meant to be a first world nation. Mm. Uh, and beyond the, the, the model that you talk about, um, I know in your submission you also talk about the fact that in rural areas, 23% of households um, have reported no access to the internet. Um, how is that also then affecting people who are seeking health care that don't have access to the internet? I think that is a, I think that's an issue. Certainly as COVID came round, uh, um, we found that um, certainly Zoom was not really effective to talk to, uh, to um, um, our patients. So because we knew our patients, uh, because they knew us, phone call works very, very well. So for telehealth, if you know your patients and they know you, a phone call is, it, it works very, very well. So internet is not a huge issue for, for, for that. Um, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the contact and, and knowing, it, knowing your patients and them knowing you. It's the personal touch. That's what people really want. So while I agree, we do have to have video health uh, and support, especially in the acute um, setting. It's having doctors on the ground whenever you can is what patients actually like. That's why I've got patients who still come and see me from Golgong, and I've left there 10 years. And I've still got patients from Dunny Do. I've still got patients, I've actually got patients in Lightning Ridge that come down to Molong to see me. So 
you know, it is the personal side of things, which I think is very, very important, especially with an older population. Um, the younger, younger, younger people, you know, they don't really worry so much about um, that, that personal touch, I don't think. I don't know, maybe just that my, my patient cohort's getting older as I get older. Thank you, thank you. And Ms Fairman. One of the things we have been hearing, um, and it, we, can't, we can't really disagree with this evidence, is that there has been like a systematic, if you like, uh, removing the resources from hospitals in rural, some hospitals in rural and remote New South Wales. So, for example, um, Gulgong, Coonabarabran, we've heard uh, a number of witnesses talk about the fact that these are very different to what they were 20 or 30 years ago. Just to the situation of continence pads and dressings not being available sometimes in some of these hospitals, that is an issue of budget, isn't it? We did hear, Mr McLaughlin, that these hospitals have to buy within the parameters, of course, of a supply budget. Is that correct? Chairman, uh, we've got a budget of over a billion dollars. For each of these small hospitals. The, across the whole of the region, uh, yeah. our budget has grown over $250 million in the last seven years. Um, coming down to some of those facilities you talk about, uh, Galgong has in the last seven years seen a 49% increase in their budget. Uh, Dunedoo, a 63% increase into their budget. So we continue to increase the budgets and the resources for towns that are relevant for the services they need to provide. So the commitment we bring is to continually look for opportunities to increase services for rural towns. There's a lot of examples of, of when we do that. Um, certainly the budget growth has been um, a significant um, part of that. But the big challenge for us is, is workforce, um, in finding the right workforce for um, all of our health services. As you've heard over the, a lot of these hearings, um, that's our most significant challenge. Okay, so you've, you're suggesting that there's been increases. Is, is this in the supply budget specifically or the budget for the hospitals? Uh, total budget. Total budget. Yet, of course, we have also heard of um, many hospitals being uh, directed to not provide particular uh, services anymore. For example, um, where they used to be able to operate and therefore um, patients, have, or for example, maternity services. So there has been um, a significant change over, say, the far past 15 or 10 years in relation to many of these hospitals. Are you saying that the budget has increased at the same time while the services are being cut? Mr. Herman, uh, there has been changes to services over the years. There's no question about that. Uh, that the vast majority of the cause of that has been workforce availability. If I go to the example of Parks Maternity that uh, was raised earlier this morning, um, we've struggled for a lot of years to recruit in the GP obstetricians, the GP anaesthetists, the midwives to um, staff those services. And what we've done in response to that is grow a service connected across Parks Forbes in that region that um, will be a service that's more sustainable. Okay, so what about the situation, just like another example, then you would have heard yesterday because you were watching that, that um, hearing as well, the evidence in relation to Coonabarabran Hospital where examples of what the LHD has deliberately stripped away from the hospital include surgical instruments, obstetric labour beds, CTG machine to monitor fetal movements and uterine contractions for pregnant women and their babies, cardiac stress test treadmill, neonatal crib and paediatric beds. What's that submission referring to? Chairman, there's no question that as services change, uh, we need different equipment and staffing uh, for those services. Uh, there are things that we um, don't need in a service like, um, like Kuna Barabran um, when they don't deliver maternity services. Did you a lot of those witness? examples you gave um, uh, 10 and 15 years ago when there was substantial change to some of those services. I think you would have heard Councillor um, Iannuzzi or Iannuzzo, his, um, his uh, evidence in relation to, I think it was the equipment used to uh, undertake stitching or sutures for patients and he said is there 
that was one example in that the quality of the equipment seems to have been downgraded as well. Did you, what's your response to that? So I might jump. Sure, Dr. Knott. Um, so uh, I heard uh, the testimony of, of uh, Dr. Ian Utsi yesterday and his reference to surgical equipment. So in, in all of our small sites uh, and, and across the state, even in larger sites, reusable equipment is not uncommon, uh, including suturing equipment. And so that the equipment that was referenced was that there was a removal of autoclavable, which essentially means cleanable, reusable equipment. However, doctors uh, and nurses are provided the equipment that they require to be able to suture and undertake those um, procedures. And certainly that's the case at Coona Barabran. Um, whilst uh, Mr McLaughlin referenced uh, that as services change, so do, does the equipment. And so to recognise that or acknowledge that, if you look at Kuna Barabran in recent years, there's been investment in new anaesthetic machine to be able to provide anaesthetic services for colonoscopy patients that uh, undertake colonoscopy in Kuna Barabran. There's been special equipment to help in the event of an emergency in regards to video laryngoscope. So that's essentially a device that allows doctors in crisis situations to be able to intubate a patient while awaiting retrieval. There's also been investment in BiPAP machines for respiratory failure, high-flow nasal prongs, which reflects the increasing um, Sure, I've got numbers. one second left. I'm sure. going to jump in with a question before the thing goes... Oh, one minute. OK, that was uh, me glancing incorrectly at that. Bathurst Council also presented um, with their concerns in relation to what they see... that what they have provided evidence about and what seems to be the case of... Uh, quite substantially less resources provided to, to, to them compared to uh, the other uh, centres of Orange and Dubbo. What's the reason for that? Mr Chairman, quite the opposite. Uh, Bathurst has seen a greater percentage budget increase than both <coughs> Orange or Dubbo. Um, there's been substantial investment in Bathurst Health Services to grow, um, orthopaedic services to grow, intensive care services to increase the neonatal um, support services. When you say, sorry, a, percentage increase, could you just explain, do you mean in terms of per capita or percentage in terms of the, the, the overall... Percentage rise? on the base of their total budget. But there's, you, that's, their, their evidence is still correct, though, is it not, that um, they have, for example, the budget for Bathurst, 88 uh, million, compared to Dubbo, 138 million, Orange, 151 million. But their, their population is, I think, slightly more. Is that correct to, to Orange and Dubbo? Madam Chair, so Bathurst budget, that $88 million, has grown by 44% in the last seven years. Um, it's a significant increase. It's an increase on a percentage basis larger than Orange and Dubbo. So we've invested in additional services for Bathurst, recognising that not just Bathurst but the communities around them that do total about 60,000 population coming into Bathurst um, do need um, those additional services. But overall, so the population of Bathurst, though, for the numbers of people in Bathurst, mm -hmm. the, the LHD is funding at Bathurst less for the amount of people in Bathurst compared to Orange and Dubbo? Just for, no, there's, that, for, there's a greater um, population that comes into Dubbo, so 120,000 population comes into Dubbo, about 90,000 into Orange and about 60,000 into Bathurst. So there's a proportional difference between the population serve they serve and the, the scale of the services. Thank you. Uh, the Honourable West Fane. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, thank you all for, for coming and appearing today. Um, and to Mr McLaughlin and Dr Knott, um, again, thank you for appearing, uh, having seen you already in uh, COBAR. Um, uh, Dr Williams, uh, thank you very much for your opening statement. I thought it was profound, um, because uh, what you uh, identified was uh, what I guess we've been hearing throughout this whole inquiry, which is um, we know that GPs are effectively a federal um, responsibility, hospitals are a state responsibility, and we've heard from councils all across the state that uh, they're feeling like they have to uh, become involved in, in healthcare because uh, there, there is a need to, uh, I guess, have a value add to, to health services to bring um, doctors there. As you said, people don't care who, which level does it and, or who does it, that they just want the services and that we need to find a way 
to work together, both state and federal. Um, and, and I think that that was really um, well enunciated in your opening statement. I guess being a PHN, obviously, you would, you look at more at the, the, the GP um, uh, component. Obviously, being state-based, we would you know look at the, the, the component that we do. How do you see us being able to integrate um, what the state does and what the feds do in order to uh, start to tackle the issues? Uh, thank you for your comments. Um, well, I, it's a story I've, I've said before, but I will repeat it for those of you that haven't heard this, but if a patient presents to Molong MPS and I go and see them uh, with a condition and I'm paid for that by the state, and then the week later I follow them up in my rooms, you, you have the same patient, the same condition, the same doctor, two funding streams, which is a nonsense. So the first thing we need to do is to have a blended system between Commonwealth and state so that we can actually see where the money could be best spent. With that, I think that we could set up a system by which it will be a blended system. I don't want to de-incentivize um, um, health care. I think it's important to, for people to, to realize that if they work hard, they get paid more. But I think we've got to get away from this idea of just a, a, um, the, a business model of, of, the, of, the, uh, of the MBS, which is, it is universal across Australia, but we need to enhance that in the country because we have higher morbidity, we have higher mortality, we have higher costs, and a lot of younger graduates do not want to come and live in the country because it might be out of fear, it might be out of their partners have already got jobs in the city, all sorts of factors. So we have to try and change that. The problem is not our uh, workforce per se, it is the market is wrong. And you, you know, there's a statement that, um, that says you can't buck the market. Well, I think we had to change the market and we have to have intervention from all levels of government to change that so that uh, rural health becomes um, something that can be supported and, and younger graduates want to support. So that's very, very important. And, and there really is a, uh, there, there's a role for each level of government, both you know, local government, state government and federal government working together on this, really isn't there? Absolutely, and that's something that the PHN has been working on. What we would like to see would be an entity set up which with input from state, commonwealth and local government and obviously local conditions in which we can maybe set up a virtual practice to support different communities so we're not, we're not uh, ending up with a, a bidding war between towns which is what councils often talk about which is yep. something which is, which is really destructive. Yep. Something in which we can, uh, we can support um, other towns for example, myself as in, in Molong, I'd be happy to remotely supervise other doctors, um, but the, the trouble is I have to earn a living too. Yep. That's the business model which I think is flawed. Yep. So we've got to start getting away from this idea of fee-for-service. Maybe we need to set up a totally different way of doing business, and that's going to need government support because no no entrepreneur is going to go in and, and, and do something in, in really hard to, to uh, uh, deal with areas. So we've got to find a complete, it's got to be bankrolled by all levels of government yep. and it has to have clinician input. Yep. And that's the vision for the future that we, we need to have because we need equity of access. Our country people deserve to have first class services. Absolutely. Yep. You know, and yep. that's so important because if, you know, if, if towns lose their GP services, I've got a daughter, she's a, she's a, she's a teacher in, in, uh, in, uh, in Queensland. Yep. She's never going to go and work in a town that hasn't got a general practice. Yep. Um, if you lose a general practice and the MPS, young people will not go and work in and live in that town. Yep. So the town, you lose the town, the economy goes yep. and we end up... Uh, and, we, you know, you joke, people joke that, you know, New South Wales means Newcastle, Sydney and Wollongong. That will be the, 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 the truth in the future, except here it'll be Dubbo 
Orange and Bathurst. Not if I have any say in it. No, anyway. and nor me either, because the lifeblood of this country is that the, the rural communities, we have to support them. They deserve that. Yeah. Now, in your experience, um, I guess, obviously, as a state um, based uh, government, uh, do we have? Do you think that we have the ability to do this on our own and tackle these problems, or is it really going to be a case that you know we're going to need all three levels of government? I think you're going to need all three, but you can make a start in the point of view that you know obviously government ministers um, at federal and state level have the power. That's what the, my opening address was about. You as politicians have the power to do anything in this country. You can close borders. Well, not us, but yeah. No, yeah. well, no, but yeah. the point is that's still government that can do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and if they can do that, you could, um, then there's all sorts of other things that, 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 that um, governments working collectively can do. Yeah. Now, general practice, yes, is funded by the Commonwealth, but hospitals are funded by the state. Why can't there be a blended system where the money that the state puts in yeah. will... Uh, Will, will come through to an entity and the MBS money plus some other money can, can develop a new model of care. Yeah. So that's, that's the vision that we need. And, and the problem is, I, I mean, I've been talking about this sort of thing for a long time to anybody who was, you know, willing to listen. But we're, getting the, we're at the pointy end now yeah. because if my generation die or retire or burn place? out, yeah. there will be nothing and then you will... If you, if you think that telehealth is bad, that's all there will be. And I really value that, that, that input and that insight because uh, as we're travelling around, you know, people, people are raising issues around uh, GP services. And as state members, we say, you know, that's, uh, uh, it, it's in the responsibility of, of the federal government and the PHNs. People don't care. You know, they, they no. want us to have that integrated system. So to have those insights today, I, I right. really appreciate it. So thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to turn uh, to uh, Dr. Knott. Now, I, I recall from Cobar, um, I think you said that you'd worked in um, Canada for a time. I, uh, I've done research in Canada, you've yes. You've done some research in Canada. Um, I, I, over the lunch break, I had a bit of a read of uh, the... Um, and I don't know if you were here when we had some evidence um, from uh, Dr... Um, uh, McCarthy. Neil McCarthy, yes, um, and he was talking about this um, uh, reimagining primary health care workforce from uh, Dr. Roger Strasser. Um, I know he was doing some research over in, in Canada as well. Do you, can you provide some insights into that? Yeah, I think um, first of all, I want to acknowledge the work that Dr. McCarthy has done for our region and continues to do in Narromine. And I yep. agree completely with Dr. Williams that general practitioners. Uh, are the cornerstone of healthcare in all of our small, rural and remote communities. Mm -hmm. That document that uh, Roger Strasser uh, has written does talk to the fact that rural generalists are required for small, rural and remote communities. What we don't need and, and what some of that document talks to is a fractured system where you create hospitalists competing with general practitioners yeah. in a small, rural and remote community. Yep. So for us, I agree completely with Dr Williams' statements that we need to work together across state and federal jurisdictions to be able to address some of the workforce challenges in the general practice space, mm -hmm. to be able to uh, address uh, hospital workforce challenges. Uh, Roger Strasser uh, set up the Northern Ontario School of Medicine, which I have been to uh, yep. and have met with, and I know Dr. Strasser, Professor Strasser personally. Okay. And that is an opportunity for us to be able to look at how do we grow our own, how do we create a pipeline of future rural generalists. Our region is very lucky uh, that we will, as of next year, have two medical schools that go end to end in terms of being able to deliver all of their training in a rural or regional environment. What we will need, though, is to ensure that those students get out to places like Molong, get out to places like Cobar, get out to places like Burke and many of our other smaller communities and get, I suppose, immersed in communities so that they are more likely to return. Yep. That's the first, first point. I could go on, but I appreciate that there's a lot of time and questions. Thank yeah. you. And I just I wanted to give you an opportunity to perhaps um, address um, some of what we've heard, um, you know, in the last couple of days, that um, an inquiry like this can provide a very, I guess, negative view of 
um, practicing medicine in a, a rural um, remote community. Uh, and do you have some views on that uh, as to uh, being able to attract a workforce after um, after just the negatives are focused on it without actually having any balance of the, uh, the, the positive uh, lifestyle benefits that can come from practicing rural regional remote medicine? Um, and also, have you heard of any, I guess, um, of what we've heard about uh, staff being um, attacked after um, uh, some of the focus, the negative focus that's been happening on, on these medical um, areas? So I think I'd start with the, the last component of your, your question there, is that our staff get up every day and do an incredible job and are committed to their rural and remote communities. They live in those areas and every person living in a small rural and remote community should be proud of the staff that live and work there. Yep. When our staff do hear uh, stories, um, because of their dedication to delivering high quality care, it does affect them personally. Mm -hmm. I am aware of many of our staff in some towns who are physically and mentally affected by um, some of the stories that are heard. Yep. This does not mean that we should not be listening. We know that as a local health district, we do not get things right 100% of the time, regardless of whether we've got face-to-face -face doctors, whether we've got virtual doctors, whether we've got nurses, allied health in any community. And we need to listen to those stories, yep. but we also need to move forward. And part of our role is being able to understand how do we do better every day, and our staff are committed to that. Okay. And um, just finally, I wanted to um, ask Mr McLaughlin. Um, I note uh, the Honourable Walt Secord's last question about um, people who might be here to, I guess, um, look at and, and witness the, the, the hearings itself. Um, do you see that as a negative, or do you perhaps see it as uh, the, the local health district and uh, the Department of Health, uh, one, taking uh, rural regional health seriously, and two, um, how, how important it is that you know, we, uh, we tackle some of the issues that are, that are being, um, uh, uh, I guess, ventilated and um, uh, presented uh, to this inquiry? Thanks, Mr. Fang. Um, I think to start off with, well, we're all incredibly committed to rural health. And what we've all grown up in rural regions, we're here because this is our life, this is our family and our friends that we're caring for. I know right across the New South Wales health system and the members of the ministry that are here, they're here to listen as we are, yeah. um, here to find solutions to problems that we've been challenged by uh, for a lot of years. And so the absolute commitment we bring is to listen and understand, but also try harder. We'll, we'll work harder for some of the solutions we need to find. Yeah. And I may be politically thank cynical, you. but I suspect that uh, he would have uh, criticised had there been nobody here. So yeah. thank you very much for your answer. Thank you all for attending this hearing. Um, I do note that there were some questions taken on notice. Um, so the committee has resolved that answers to questions taken on notice will be returned within 21 days, um, but the Secretariat will contact you in relation to the questions you have taken on notice. Um, this concludes our hearing for today and uh, the live streaming will cease.